Shanghai Dragons win the June Joust. Runaway disbands. Dallas falls short just a tiny amount. It's episode 179. Welcome to the Tactical Crouch Podcast. Welcome back for another week of this. we have uh, getting into some really good stuff today. And if you caught last episode, or if you didn't catch last episode, I should probably say, I'm here. I'm Avril. You might be seeing me for the first time. This might be your second time seeing me. But it's been a pretty decent week. I really enjoyed last episode, guys. Yeah, it was a good time. It was, you know, again, kind of a, a, a not a leap of faith. I think we all, uh, you know, knew that you'd kill it, do an extremely good job. Just but flowery it's just that, boy you know, again. Starting of a new a new chapter, you know. Oh, a new yeah. chapter. Listen, l- let me be poetic sometimes, okay? Let me wax <laughs> lyrically. As, this as, man is know. about, like, to unpack his uh, Aristotle in this, like, just, like, weaving yeah. the fr- like, like i just get in my, DMs, in my soul oh, oh joe was on his bs again like it's just like oh what did you write this time it's like <laughs> <laughs> did you really oh, like, no, no 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 i'm making this up but this like it's we're frequently surprised where the metaphors go not not in a bad way but uh oh, yeah good. no it's just like this avril doesn't even know what it, he, uh what we're talking about oh, simply it, because he doesn't no read volumes uh, I mean, content who, I about some stuff that happened 177 episodes ago. That's just what I'm getting out of this. Oh, this is this is this is almost farther gone. This no, is no, no. Like the it, it, it's it's more also like how he writes nowadays. You know, it's the it's like the the flowery bits. Like he used to start with like trees and pines and everything, and made a metaphor of like the yep. flowers and the pines and the trees, and you know, like when those Stars guys were. Writing? And then now it's just right. like the most abstract stuff. It's just like basically trying to pull your heartstrings in with every line. And uh, sometimes he accuses people of being people lazy. Feel, man. That's, that's just his portfolio. <laughs> <True>. <laughs> I mean, it's the only non-writer here in this trio. You know, I, I got to do all my hot takes and controversy on this show uh, and via Twitter. So that's, uh, these, are two, these are my two mediums, really. So... Uh, I don't know, maybe I gotta, it's I gotta more red anyway, let's be honest. Point. Like, <laughs> Oh, well, 100%. <laughs> gotta put out a, a, an article to anger the Dallas fans or something like that, you know how it works. There you go, there you um, go. And, you know, it's, it's what it's about, you know, you, you, the internet exists to cause controversy, so, you know, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you just dig into that? Uh, speaking of some controversial stuff, gentlemen, uh, we got some interesting topics today. I mean, not really controversial, there's only like just one major bit of news over the past week that kind of happened that was a little bit, you know, soul-crushing, but overall tournament and stuff went pretty well and we're going to be pretty much recapping the june just tournament talking over all those kind of results and looking at where the standings are that kind of stuff but as we head into the episode gentlemen to thank our our patrons first of all for episode 179 so this episode of technical crunch podcast is brought to you by refine bean fraudino battle crab lolshin rick zane sir girth a lot pork chop sammy cash 67 chara Nathan, Your Misery, Fabled Steven, Roger B, Chris R34444, Bronze Hot Tub, Bronze Bot, Bronze Pot Boo How, I got that wrong, Hotel Bravo 11, Hunter Tain, Yeskas or Percentage Shower Gel, and Chonk. Without further ado, gentlemen, uh, first thing I want to talk about is actually the runaway stuff because that came up pretty recently this week and felt like it'd be a good idea to go over it now instead of later on because we're about to get into heavy June Joust related topics. And it'd be kind of weird to then just like kind of fit Runaway in there while we're talking about June Jow. So I think we should go into it now. Um, pretty big stuff that happened is that fact that Runaway maybe currently, I would say, the longest running Overwatch team. I'm not even really saying Overwatch League here. I'm just saying Overwatch team in general. The longest hmm. running Overwatch team that I'm aware of has now officially disbanded and dissolved their Overwatch side of operations. When I read into their official announcement, they did specifically say Overwatch. If you, if we can take a look at the the actual yes statement, they said um, we're going to notify a little heavy and sad news: the journey of Runaway Overwatch team ends today. Now, as far as I'm aware, Runaway do also operate other teams. They have a League of Legends team, still yes. not too sure if they're still doing stuff in that space. Um, yeah, they've been here since 2016, seven run ups and eight wins, um, and just a lot of history. Probably the most beloved team in Overwatch history across all the kind of rosters that they've had so we're talking about franchise here in terms of runaway um and they're finally gone which is you know i think a very sobering moment for overwatch esports 100 percent. i mean this is the team that you know we, we fondly remember that comes out with their iconic 
let's let's be honest it it's iconic the the pink grandma sweaters you know if if anything apex had some of the most bold uniforms right with kong doing their their kind of uh, mechanic and sailor outfits and and but runaways is uh, simply you knew what you were looking at you know the branding was was spot on um and in transitioning that into you know such a beloved team and such a um a wholesome team you know the the idea of the family kind of is centered around them and and them being such you know close friends and and how that ended up it's it's sad to see him go it's it's really you know kind of a a sign of the times with certain things it's it's sad yeah um we hate to see him go but uh you know it's it's, it's a fond farewell it's you know, a lot of memories to be you know had and and you know thankful for them and and for all of you know a runner and flowervin's time and effort and and setting this up and putting it together i remember watching their you know them getting a washer and dryer and being excited in the team house mm-hmm. like wow we can actually wash clothes we can actually have internet we have our own space finally it was it was fun to kind of live if ever you know the, the, the tiniest bit vicariously through them and how excited they were about these you know kind of mundane things and seeing you know their players kind of grow and succeed so yeah it's it's uh it's bittersweet in some ways yeah i remember when when titans um suspended their team i had a take which was a little bit too heavy at the time and still is uh saying like basically every overwatch story uh revolves around or every good Overwatch story revolves around Runaway, which is a bit sure. reductive because there's good good stuff happening in Europe in, in terms of history of the yeah. game and how uh, yeah. people develop there. But I will say there's never been a more important team in the history of Overwatch, if you think about it. Oh, yeah. So totally. you start from the storytelling aspect. It starts in Season 2, goes over to the- Season 3, Season 4 as well. They're, if they're not the champions, they're at least the, the reflectors or like the villains that not villain characters, even though they did have villains at some points, the rivals, in times, uh, in their team. Then yeah. they are the team that promoted the most, uh, actually not just talent but high quality talents to the Overwatch League. Mm. Like, there's very few runaway players that were ever on bottom tier teams, right? Um, Shui comes yeah. to mind, I guess. Um, otherwise, like. These guys usually play uh, towards like the top five of the league, right? Um, mm-hmm. What they brought in terms of storytelling, in terms of emotion, I don't know. I feel like I feel like the metaphor of runner runner punching through the ceiling is perfect for this team. Like yep. whatever they did, they somehow did it better than everyone else in their position with the resources that they had, and then like they they works at some point capped in their ability to uh, bring that impact to, to, to the wider Overwatch space and did their best. And for that, you can only uh, thank them. But it is a very mm-hmm. sad state of affairs because in both instances, both in now and in, uh, with this situation, it is unfortunately an expression of where, where we are in the times. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, at the same time, it's it's actually impressive to look back uh, at this team. Like, oh, sure. it's it's like in order to get close, you would have to piece KDP and Element Mystic together to c- get close to their accolades, yeah. right? And even then, you don't have like the the fe- like the the inner family, like Runner Flowervin, like that duo, basically financially supporting the start of it, right? Like, it, you can't write this stuff. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, this is like the people's team, and I say the people's team yeah. because it, it's like this is really real grassroots, kind of from the ground up, real mom and mom and dad kind of vibe with Flowervin and Runner. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, literally married couple, and they even have a kid. And then Runner's always described his teams, you know, the, the players on his team as his other kids. Um, I mean, I think both Flower, Flowervin and Runner have described their players in that kind of way. Uh, but I think the w- reason why the, this team is so beloved. And has such a great history and has had for the longest time. I'm pretty sure, definitely in Korea, the largest Overwatch fan base in terms of, you know, uh, for for an endemic Korean team. 
the reason why people love this team so much is because a their story is great but also they're such a relatable team because this is not some mega corporation team they're not like mm, this yeah. giant organization you know they're not this giant like huge corp with millions and millions of dollars they're pulling in huge funding from investors or anything like that they're just the closest that it could ever be to just like a you and me kind of thing like just a regular regular kind of people you yep. know living their dream and having a team and runner playing in that team and the original story runaway is just like you know it's kind of runner with his squad um he wanted to have a team to to play competitively in overwatch because he loved the game and they competed and you know they they had insanely good um results for for what it was and they're, they're competing against teams with, mu with much better funding much better backing and for this team that was so grassroots and so from the ground up they ended up doing super well and that that just journey just con continued through um from apex era into contenders up until this point where you know finally they called it quits it everything about them just screamed genuine right um from like you said the relatability to how successful they've been across how many years five getting i mean if we if we really stretch in it it's, no, for it's sure five, five but yeah it's 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 just impressive that they've they've kind of invested in this game that long um and in a weird way i i i hope there, there's a part of my heart my brain is definitely fighting me on this but my heart is like maybe there's some some hope here maybe there's a some positive spin where maybe runner and flowervin get brought into an overwatch league team and and they're the new gms for a rebuild next season and they're going to yeah. take because again when you look at this team's history it's consistently filtered up new talent but it's also brought in a ton of new talent as well there's there's obvious skills there that both of these individuals have have crafted over these you know four to five years that these teams can put a price tag on and and say look like you've been very successful in this yes you may have stopped your own individual you know team or organization but would you like to come on and, and work for us i think that'd be a super fun story maybe there's you know some tie-in of the branding maybe somebody rebrands i don't know like there's a small world where this might happen but um for my own coping state i choose to live there at the moment it's um <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, assuming they have other teams, which I think they do, they'll be yeah. moving towards that and just working towards Probably. that. Probably, yeah. On the runaway brand, I think I don't actually know. I'm I'm sort of speculating and guessing here, because mm. um, I knew they were running other esports teams, but um, they would, I, as far as I'm aware, in the, the specific announcements that the wording of it was for Overwatch. It could actually be for the entire runaway brand, which would be a little bit more sad. Um, but I, even so, Overwatch was like their main brand. That was like their main yeah. team. And you know, there was a brilliant kind of thread on Twitter of uh, translations from, it might have been, yeah, it was from the stream that uh, Flavin and Runner did to actually announce this. And Kevin Kim, uh, at Kevin Kim Lol, who is a translator for Horizon Esports, translated a whole bunch of stuff over about, you know, how Runner, they were thinking about maybe disbanding even six to seven months prior. Um, it's been you know four years of them operating runaway as you know runner's been on the team and also as you know the owner and everything like that and during that time as well by the way this isn't part of the actual translation but i remember when runner actually went to the military for his mm. mandatory service and flauvin was running the team kind of solo and uh, ironically that's when they actually started winning and they stopped <laughs> coming second they actually started pounding from there and started winning from uh, that was like generation two runaway and mm. you talk about the fact that every single runaway squad to date has been super successful even their latest one which you'd argue probably had maybe the least success they still ended up having really good runs that you know they didn't win they didn't get to a grand final anymore but they had um a team that came closer to taking down the grand finals which was o2 blast in the season that i was just a, a part of and part of me secretly well not even secretly but you know i wouldn't even say selfishly i was gonna say selfishly but i think a lot of people would agree would have loved to have seen uh runaway operate for at least one more season close out the year but sure. reading through the interview well not the interview reading through the translation of the stream they did it seems like they were you know in a state of financial uh, duress with the team and it was getting expensive and all this kind of stuff and time as well i mean again this is this is like a family venture yeah. they have their own kid as well um they have other things to look after um they have to stream as well because they're they're both flower and a runner mainly stream as a source of income if i read everything correctly and mm. just trying to handle everything and juggling everything means they're not really 
doing enough and you know there's a part of that translation says runner says i needed to stream but that means i can't take proper care of the team Balvin says chasing two rabbits but you can't catch both runner says you can't if i focus my attention on the kids which is the the overwatch team i have to take a step back from streaming i tried that last year but just because i did that doesn't mean situation with the league doesn't get better the dilemma with the system cycle merges the biggest thing with the move from twitch to youtube there was no longer the for mentioned overlap he's talking about how like at least if it was on twitch he could be co-streaming on twitch and maybe right. some sort of overlap with his you know, twitch audience it's just yeah he's he, in that specific interview he um, not interviewed the translation he listed out a whole bunch of issues that uh, he was having uh, which led to the eventual demise of the team mm-hmm. yeah i i think i think you guys can mention this point kind of at the top of the you know the the, the breakdown but it, it was kind of surprising to see them go this long with kind of still kind of maintaining that mom and pop you know ragtag just kind of throwing it together by the seat of their pants and not you know trying to take on some sort of money and credit to them they did it for such a long time and were extremely successful um literally paying out of their own pocket to fund what is effectively one of you know like you said the the, the best or one of the most um centric stories and and the overwatch lore right I, I, I think the the orbiting metaphor, right? Most most mm-hmm. stories tend to orbit around uh, runaway and their tail. So, yeah, it's it's a it's a sad day, terrible day for a race. It's it's, it's also part of me thinks. Could you have maybe like made it through the season, waited for Overwatch two, see what the market is like then, and then come back? That's part of me hopes that. I mean, there's. I think that there, was mentioned. I'll try and find it? it for you. Go on. Right. I'll try um, and find it for you while you... It's, it's also, the other thing is, I mean, we know that in the Overwatch League, certain teams mm-hmm. have esports team partners. So the investors have esports teams. Like, yeah. I'm thinking of Vancouver Titans and Luminosity. Something like this, right? It would be super dope if there was ever a possibility where m- maybe we, if we had an expansion slot open up uh, a second one in Korea, that would be... At least the managerial team of uh, you know fl- uh, Run and Flowen. Um, True. Another thing that actually like makes this much more impressive as well is that they did it through military service, right? Mm-hmm. Like that in itself. Like not only does that cut down on your ability to help out with a business, it also cuts down on your streaming income. I would imagine, right? But if you suddenly only have one of, of the those guys streaming in that regard, like it's it's a big thing, right? And uh, mm-hmm. that was particularly impressive that they were able to maintain their, honestly, excellence throughout all these seasons and basically not skipping a beat. Actually, probably getting but, more uh, more uh, successful once Runner was. I gotta add a bit of context because you. I know you're talking about like you know maybe they could join up and be an organ that way, something related to Overwatch League. But typically, when um, a franchise wants to partner with an endemic team to do that kind of stuff. I mean, use Luminosity as, a, as the example. We're, we're talking about more like um, refined organizations that are have a little bit more backing, a little yes. bit of infrastructure involved, you know. And Runaway are so grassroots, they're not really that type of team. I could see somebody like Runner being picked up. Someone might offer like, hey, Runner, would you like to be yeah. a GM? Or like, would you like to be this or that? Or maybe for both you run around and Flauben, or either one. Um, but like as a as a like a runaway thing, I don't know. To me, this feels I wouldn't say pretty final, but um I can see this being like and you 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 was saying before as well, like why not wait for Overwatch 2? I think the better option that maybe they're taking now is if you've got to wait for Overwatch 2, maybe the better decision is to go on hiatus now then actually wait for Overwatch 2, and then when that comes out, reassess the situation, rather yeah. than, if you are bleeding cash, keep bleeding up until that point where you might just end up bleeding out and do irreversible well, damage, put yourself, into, put yourself into massive debt. Yeah. Um, but I mean, that was actually mentioned, it was like, what does it say here? It was, it has been a while since we were operating at a loss. I've been stubborn in that past and to continue operating the team, which is why we have gotten this far. Those around me ask if I could wait for Overwatch 2 at least. Uh, I don't think he actually put it in answer, um, he said that people did ask that, but he didn't put an answer. And I can imagine, sure. like you know, it, what I said is probably true. It's like if you were gonna wait, you just wait while being disbanded because mm. you're bleeding cash. I'm a little surprised they they bled as much as they did. I don't, I, I mean, I don't know what salaries they're paying. I don't know what kind of benefits they sure. give to their teams. 
Um, mm. I think they have operated Team House in the past, but I think that was more like I don't know if that's just within Runner's own house itself. Um, right. But for example, by the way, they've actually managed to ship off 15 players to the Overwatch League over the entire course of Runaway. If I've just looked through all their yeah. past players, and they have so many players and that's just overwatch league by the way we're talking about buyouts here and in terms of overwatch league teams having to buy out obviously everyone remembers the, remembers the massive vancouver titans uh buyout where they sold off how many players was that eight players all at one go um and they really wanted to keep the team together and all that kind of stuff as well so i can imagine they got a tidy sum from that i don't no idea how, how much money they earned um but if you include all the buyouts from 15 players they probably got a decent amount of money but then they're also having to cover operational costs of keeping those players going so they really need to you know the hope is for a lot of these tier two teams and this is not even just runaway anymore this is like every tier two team to mm. justify their existence really you need to be a team that can sell off a player to the overwatch league or sell off to a player to another team to pay off that uh and buyout fee and then you've maybe justified the money you've you've spent and hopefully that buyout fee covers the cost that you put into developing that player so that you can make a little bit of profit on that as well because that's the whole point of having any sort of business right so mm -hmm. um crazy to me that it ended up one of the most successful teams in exporting plays to the league still ended up operating a loss mm -hmm. yeah. yeah by the way there's, the other team. <laughs> there, there's, there's also another thing that comes with this it's maybe a little bit underrated but there's suddenly a bunch of free agents that are actually all pretty good right is this mid-season pickup pickings like are you? Are there any players you're looking at and you're going like, okay, I want to put, put this. I mean, Mary is the obvious one for me as well. Uh, I might be the only one on the planet who's like 50-50 on Merit. I everyone think he's very hit or miss. Everyone sings his praises, but I've I've seen some really awkward moments as well. Yeah, that that says to me like, well, you know, it it balances out his really good. Moment. Like you said, hit or miss. Like on his good mm. days, he's really there, but I mean, he's. He um, he's not That's quite a he suit. It's not quite a he suit. But then there's a lot of players that are not quite, you know, the yeah. same as what we had in in the previous iteration of Runaway. Mm -hmm. Just hard and to you can on. you can kind of tie that to a lot of players. Like I remember Shy last, or it might not even been last year. Maybe I'm getting my timelines mixed up. But I remember Shy doing some real goofy stuff, and and it doesn't it doesn't necessarily detract. I think Merritt is definitely like a step down from that, but is somebody super exciting that if you were if he was given the right coaching mm -hmm. plugged into the right situation i think he could really surprise some people maybe not rookie of the year status depending on his class but definitely somebody to 100 to keep your eyes on if well, i don't if know if anyone familiar. needs a player now though because all the teams are kind of exactly up. like who you know who are you replacing if you're the only person who's i think kind of positions are really in a bit of a bind as it could be like Mike Kelly or a God's B, but yep. though we're looking at teams where like, I think Hangzhou are fine, whether they have God's B or not. Um, I think Gonjo might want to think about replacing Mike Kelly, but he, maybe he gets better as well. Um, hmm. but I don't see a lot of positions open in the league where like, man, they got to get the, the these, these positions up for grabs. These positions are at risk. There's not a lot of them that exist for me and on the teams that are performing poorly, they're not interested in replacing players anyway, because they're, they're looking to, just kind of survive for the year and have a team for the year and do whatever right they don't they don't necessarily i'm not talking about the team itself but i'm talking about like the maybe the management side they're probably mm. not super bothered that they're losing they probably knew they were going to lose anyway so they're not interested in trying to get better players because if they were interested in trying to get better players they would have done that before the season started yep i think this is where or this this is the start uh and, and funnily enough it kind of hits mid-season um i think this is the start for a lot of teams to kind of evaluate where they sit and start the the process of either rebuilding um i don't think we'll actually see too many people signed mid-season um for a number of reasons right like covid still obviously has a stranglehold on a lot of things a lot of you know knock-on effects from that i still don't know if everybody's uh super how to put this um I don't know if more budget is going to be injected to allow for midseason signings, right? Like, there's, there, there's a lot. True. And, and again, I'm speculating. I'm gonna say no. Yeah, I, I don't think that midseason is gonna see a ton of movement. Yeah. I think this is where teams start to plan for the future. Yeah, I mean, 
As there's sad pro- as it is, I'd love to see mid seasons, but there's probably not more budget injected, probably more immediacy communicated because some teams are not getting like much out of no. this league at the moment, right? But but is one player going to do that though? Might as well try. Like you can sign these kids for fifty k. Okay, then you gotta expend like whatever it is for the lawyers to uh, get them over. Yeah. That said, you like get them there in time. Yeah, I mean it, it. It's definitely going to be hard. Yeah, for sure. Not worth the cost. If you're a struggling team, you you knew you were going to struggle. Valiant, biggest example. They they yeah. knew they were. They would have been happy with one win this year, and they might not get a win this year. We'll see. It's like they're not picking up a new player. I don't think yeah. Titans or London will pick up a new player. They wouldn't go for a Korean player anyway. There's yeah, no way I'm, they get I'm them thinking more like game. someone like Boston, right? Boston I think Boston are the up and up, right? They kind of fall, think, you know. They yeah. Boston, uh, they got enough players, and they're all decent players. So mm. I don't really mm-hmm. see a position there being open. That's what I'm saying. There's just like no positions open for mid season, and we're not talking about season one, season two of Watch League, where every team is dropping hard cash, and you know heaps of teams yeah. were going for mid season pickups because they were all trying to win. Now you've definitely got teams that look like they're in survival mode. They just want to make it through the year with the minimum possible. Um, again, LA Valiant, right? Big example. So. I just don't see, and you, then you've got players like the biggest example of like would a Chinese team pick up a Korean player? You got the whole Takayaki in Korea thing while Hangzhou play, and then he's got bad ping. Yeah. Like, you want to go through that? You, you can't even get these Korean players into China if they play online. It sucks anyway. So it's just like, no, I, I don't even see a Chinese team going for it. Mm. Um, and that would be the most viable. Yeah. No, so I, I think the game. only two teams that would make sense are, uh, I think, Boston and Toronto. Also, keep in mind, theoretically speaking just like if you have your players on 30 days might as well make use of that clause and free up some budget Mm -hmm. if you wanted to sure um but yeah i i definitely like the very fact that pine takes so long to get here even though he had a pre-existing visa before yep makes me think this is a bigger process than uh giving it credits at the moment yep i'm gonna mention something as well and just to move the conversation along to a, a wider conversation about tier two real quick mm-hmm. um because obviously there was a lot of discussion about you know this wasn't this venture for runaway wasn't super um we could probably say profitable or super you know revenue heavy for the team and obviously is going to impact their ability to run a run an operation here and that operation's shut down now um, but consider that Runaway for the longest time has been one of the more successful teams. I'm not just talking about results, but one of the biggest fan bases, which means they get a lot of merch sales. I know that domestically they, they get a decent amount of that. I, and obviously that's not going to, unless you're like a hundred thieves, you're not making enough from yeah. merch sales to cover your operations here, right? The hundred thieves is like 50% of a clothing company at this stage. So it's a totally different ball game. Um, so it's just kind of wild to me that one of the more successful teams in tier two overall have called it quits because it's too unstable for them and now we can talk about there's a couple of different areas to tackle there one is covid's a big issue let's not beat around the bush about it covid has screwed over a lot of things um and has made esports operation especially at this kind of ground level because this is you know you i I like that joe you're going to bring up the mom and pop kind of thing because that it feels like they're the ones running a small business on the side of the road where they really need customers to come and shop kind of deals we're not talking about some mega corporation yeah so you know, and the mom and pop shops during COVID on the street, they're the ones that are going to suffer the most from any sort of COVID related issue, right? That's kind of the vibe I get from this team. Um, so there's a, there's a, maybe a greater conversation here about how, I mean, tier two definitely has its issues uh, on top of that. And totally. COVID has not helped, right? No, if anything, like you said, I, I think I kind of take that, you know, like I, I, I think you paint a nice picture for Runaway, but I think you can apply that to a lot of different teams. Um, we're seeing academy teams slowly come back, which is a great sign. Love to see that. Hopefully, more. Um, you know, just the one more, right? more. Just Boston. Uh, Boston uh, fusion moving to Europe is is oh, interesting. That's true. That's true. But but there still is you know good things happening. I know um, at least talking to certain other GMs in the past. You know, it's been on the table. They're considering things. When it's right, they'll move. It, it it seems like everybody's keeping a very close eye on tier two, which is good, right? It's it's better than just immediately saying no and, and having an apathy towards it. Um like you said, there are issues too way too big and, and uh messy to kind of get in the nitty-gritty of, but 
Um, Overwatch 2 has the 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 wideness and the vagueness to do a lot of good for a lot of different people, including tier, tier two. So fingers crossed that, uh, you know, that comes with some change. So we'll see. We'll see. I mean, it's like when you have a COVID situation that affects everyone at the top level, that trickles down mm-hmm. really quickly. Or what are you going to cut first? Yep. You're probably going to start cutting tier two. Yeah. It's unfortunate. That's just it's expendable. The case. Um, it does. It's not that it doesn't provide value. It definitely provides value. But when you're strapped and, and you know, your bottom lines being attacked by something you really can't control or have any idea of when it's going to stop kind of being in control. The, the, the things that don't provide immediate financial value or just remove you from the, the venture, probably, like you said, first to probably I'll say, go. unless Jessica wanted to jump in first, um, I'll say that, like, you know, for me, tier two for the longest time is just only really justified by tier one existing in the mm-hmm. Overwatch League. Uh, beyond that as well, like a lot of people like, I don't know, why isn't tier two better, all this kind of stuff? And I think you, when you look at it more broad, more kind of broadly as well most tier two scenes and most esports scenes aren't and most esports yeah. aren't like huge the only like really successful tier two that i can see is really the league of legends stuff with mm-hmm. lcs's academy and that but that's you know at that it's almost at that point it's like tier 1.5 it's not even really tier two anymore because it's it's all just they're all just academy teams there's no mm-hmm. other teams outside of that which is kind of the direction that i would i think is the only way that tier two can be truly successful in overwatch is like if you kind of delete NA contenders and replace it with, you know, an Overwatch Academy League. Academy League, like literally yep. an Overwatch Academy League where all the NA teams have an Academy League team that also plays and that you do it the same way LCS does where you don't have a bench for your main team. You have an Academy team that acts as your bench. So you have six players in your main team, six players in your Academy team, and then you can rotate players in and out how you feel like. And so your bench players are playing in their own league, the Academy, and that's tier 1.5. And then that gives a uh, reason for people to watch because people, I don't know, I don't, I think a lot of people just don't care enough about seeing, nope. you know, these academy teams that aren't, you know, broadly recognizable. They, there's the Overwatch League teams, and then that's it. Everybody else is kind of in the background. Uh, people would care a lot more if it was based on an academy system, but that gets expensive for the Overwatch League team. There needs to be some justification there, and there's a reason why a lot of the you know, known esports orgs have kind of pulled out of of Watch Tier Two as well because you you no longer get the kind of, you know, um, even back in the day, you know, when you had way back in the day before Overwatch League, you had the Fnatic's and the TSM's and the Luminosities mm-hmm. and all that. That those are long gone now, and you are not going to see any of that in Tier Two. Yeah, yep. I mean, there's a there's a point to be made about basically every or very, very many businesses in esports are traffic volume related, right? So mm-hmm. if you look at, like, publications, they're traffic volume related, right? Or have business plans based on volume. Um, Twitch is the same, streaming. Even though, you, yes, you can cultivate an audience that's more willing to spend on you, right? premise of the Overwatch League was always that we needed to get the average uh, viewers spending up, right? Possibly, we succeeded in that. We also have opted into a strategy where we are actively taking the, uh, the strategy, which is, for instance, going to YouTube, that is going to net you net less viewers, but you're hopefully going to make it that up by um, having better business deals ba- based on that, right? Now, mm. if there's no process to help out the people that still monetize via volume, then the current system of tier 2 was always going to fail, right? Like, there's no trickling down of these uh, better monetization schemes uh, into the uh, second tier team, and there was no um, help coming there from from the top, then that was just going to uh, eventually happen as volume decreased, right? So... Sure. That also uh, um, means, conversely, that hopefully, with Overwatch 2 um, coming out, that now looks to be a much different game that actually could bring people back into the interest of PvP. uh, Mm -hmm. Because we made so many changes to PvP, or going to, um, that this might revitalize the esports scene, that then that system might work again and might attract people again. Problem now is... Oh, totally. 
like now there's skepticism, right? Like a lot of a lot of spending in Overwatch in, in esports is done on um, potential, right? Yeah. Now potential is also based on how likely you feel something will pop off and you will be like one of the first movers. If you've already uh -huh. seen this product in in with the views that it's getting right now and whatnot, even like you might not have the intricate sure. knowledge to understand that. Like, for instance, think about what's happening right now. I think it's unarguable that this product that we're, that the Overwatch League is putting out this season is better than last season. It's more fun. Yeah. The games are more fun. The broadcast is more fun. It's higher quality. Uh, we're getting home stands back, and despite that. It's always going to be the case. It's, it's in every walk of life, this is true. Improvement lags behind recognition. Sorry, other way around. Recognition lags behind improvement. So you have to be good for a long time until pe people realize, oh, wait a okay. moment, like, this is actually like, has gotten way better, and I cogn like, I'm aware that this has gotten better, right? Like, it, it mm. needs to seep into them. And it's unfortunately the case that we, it feels like we're in this delta between the two spaces right now. And I'm not sure if we're catching up until two, Overwatch 2 hits. That said, I hope that this means that people take into account that this league's production and product has gotten a lot more viewer-friendly and uh, attracting than uh, last season. There's a huge improvement uh, there, right? So, if this keeps 100%. moving into that tra trajectory, I hope at least endemic people, like, think of all the esports organizations that ne have never gotten into Overwatch, like the big ones, um, maybe mm -hmm. that, like, like, them seeing that we're going into the more, you know, content create like, jokey, like, that type of niche, where a lot of them are moving into, um, maybe that helps us. I think that's a big move, by the that way, that a lot of the, the esports are doing, right? Like, if you look at League of Legends, like, the broadcast is entertainment a sure. lot of the time with their production of, like, you know, the music videos. If you look at the Dota... The, do, you, do I have to talk about the Do Dota Animager? Like, what, what, <laughs> what kind of a mess yeah. that was? Um, you know where your bread's buttered. Let's, let's be honest, folks. Yeah, and, like, Overwatch League is moving into that direction. Um, and... It's taken a while, but we're getting there. Yeah, I think I think that's a confident vector that needs to be a reality within evaluations. Yeah, just not sure if it's that, you know, tangible it's to investors. All fine and good for Overwatch League. That doesn't. I don't see that helping Tier Two. Like the problem is Tier Two is Tier Two. It's literally marketed as the worst product because it is. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's not. It's worse in the sense that like it's got the, you know, lower quality players and teams and competition, whatever. Like that's just the reality. But the, you don't. Mm. You don't get the big orgs investing into tier two. They invest. They're they're coming in for the big things. They're not playing Overwatch League. It's pointless. Totally. Um, like this doesn't really. At the end of the day, um, I think I think the Overwatch League broadcast and you know, as someone that's in it, it's it's brilliant this year. I love it this year. It's it's, it's really brilliant uh, how the esport is. Um, it's moving in all the right directions. That hasn't trickled down into tier two yet. That's that's got right now. Tier two is its own thing that is. You know, I think there have been some improvements in terms of allowing each region to have its own sort of format and do what works for its own regions but there's nothing there that makes people want to watch tier two more i mean there's a lot of support in terms of endemically like support tier two but then like half the people that say yeah. that don't actually watch anyway yes um and there's just not a lot of reason for you to want to watch tier two and there's no and we talk about you know you brought up teams that need traffic to come on through even if there was a little bit more traffic that's one thing um, but you can't sell sponsorships on tier two because the, the, there's a lot of sponsorship restriction in general. That's just all locked up. So if you're a team wanting to operate mm. in tier two, unless you're literally like a player based team that isn't paying salaries, that doesn't have overhead costs, and that's just playing for the sake of playing, you know, you're in trouble. You can't be an actual organization that needs to make money and operate in tier two because you're just going to lose. Um, you're not selling sponsorship here and you are not getting enough viewership to justify anything. So. It's um I can see why all these teams for the longest time have pulled out, academy teams have pulled out. Um the only academies that exist currently are there to kind of you know, if you're the case of Boston, um Boston have an entire model where they sell off players from their main team and their academy team. Um 
you brought up Fusion, Joe, and it's like, well, I get it, but you know, Fusion University are back to supplement the fact that they have players stuck in Europe who need something to do yeah. right now, and it makes sense for them to play in contenders, so might as well revive Which that. is valuable. It's yeah, not monetarily it's, it's valuable, not like, but... It's not, like, it's not like Fusion saying, oh, we see a lot of exactly. financial benefit here in Tier 2, so let's invest in it again. It's no, we have players here and they need to play, yeah. so they might as well play. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I mean... To your, to your point, right, like... Uh, the league itself, right? The Overwatch League, you know, prime, call it that, um, has, you know, found Fox its prime. sea legs or the, the beginning of its, you know, uh, stability when it comes to like its voice of its broadcast. I think as we see that continue to grow, that may trickle down or that freedom that, you know, the league is given could supplement itself in, in tier two quite a lot. Um, and in that same way, I think you mentioned something that I've been very in support of for a long time is creating an Academy League. I think having fan bases like the Dallas Fuel, like the Houston Outlaws, like Atlanta, right? Having a, a very clear, defined, like, this is your Academy team. If you want to see where the coaches are looking for the main team, even if it's kind of a, a benevolent lie in some you know instances, as mean as that might sound, um, it does draw people in. I, I, I do believe that. I think Blizzard if anything, has done a great job at attracting that that super passionate traditional sports fan that's like, this is my team, I'm here for it, I want to be an Atlanta supporter, so where else can I be supporting this team or this franchise, right? If they have an academy team, I'm going to go watch them. If they're you know participating in this event, I'm going to go over there and, and show some love. I think that, along with Overwatch 2, and possibly, you know, the the in, you know shot in the arm for the Overwatch League itself, it, it does have potential to, to double back to Yiska's point. Um, but it predicates a lot to, on put a reset button, right? Yes, 100%. This, this whole thing is a reset button. Um, it, it just has to be communicated very early, which, um, is, 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 is rough, right? It's a, it's a very big reach to say all of these things kind of have to align for it to be successful. You but even if some of them do, button. Because exactly. So just if Overwatch 2 releases and contenders are just, what it is right now again yeah, it's, it's, too, it's going nothing's going to change path. nothing will change you're going to get a bit of you're going to get a brief viewership bump because of new players coming in right that, that's it then yeah the, 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 the novelty will wear off the fundamental structure of the whole thing is just not attractive enough 100%. yeah the thing is like i think there's definitely a thing to be said about size of a scene and the the, f the percentages of what is then sustainable right like there's mm. writers in basketball that like for instance um like write very esoteric topics right and you you ask yourself sure. who would read that well 0.001 percent of the audience will turns out that's sustainable in a sport that is watched a lot has millions right yeah worldwide billions of people yeah. so the same is true like sometimes i'm really like amazed or by what kind of content creators, for instance, in League of Legends can make a living based on uh, what kind of content they put out, right? Mm. Um, I'm thinking of maybe Ashley Kang, who does post-match interviews sure. and a lot of that type of stuff, right? Um, where it's like, like the 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 size of the scene and the trickle down process of, like, there's a certain percentage of people that are interested in every little part of content that you might think about. And if the Overwatch League was to explode to be a tier one esport, then that would also inevitably uh, impact contenders positively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 100%. Used to get 10k concurrent on NA contenders on Twitch in its heyday. I think the prime, the absolute peak of contenders, I'm talking about like, I don't, I don't count Post contender season, season zero, zero, which is yeah. basically like overwatch yeah. prequel like yeah. overwatch league prequel that doesn't count because that's just overwatch league yeah but like real contenders that's not not overwatch league was like season one 2018 right in a live yep. desk you had dp um you know i think it was amika and jameson as well something like that and then they had um old spice as a sponsor 10k concurrence on on if i remember correctly most of the matches right um mm -hmm. and that and like all these academy teams like oh, so many academy teams um, I think 2019 was the kind of end, the end of the golden age of contenders. And even then, between 2018 and 2019, it was slowing down quite significantly. And 2019 
was the last time, and especially that gauntlet, because everyone was holding up for these, everyone's looking forward to these like big international events, which were, by the way, very successful. I think that was yeah. a very good part of the contenders model that, you know, I got to really applaud the contenders team for, because that was brilliant. Um, you know, gauntlet, you saw, you see all these academy teams coming in, you know, Atlanta's Atlanta Academy did super well there. And then a bunch of those players went to rain. Um, yeah, that was, that was the kind of end of, the golden era of contenders is from 2020 onwards. It's been pretty rough because, you know, COVID definitely impacted things. Yeah. But uh, that's when most of the academy teams kind of pulled out. Um, I also, I had this, I was kind of fiddling with this the entire time, but I forgot to show it up. But I even, I even I got myself a runaway paddle stick to spank all the naughty oh. kids out there. Or <laughs> there you go. Smack talking and just being, being bad. Um, it's actually a mirror. So you can take oh, a good right. hard look at yourself as to what's wrong with here too right now. <laughs> yeah. Shameful lunatic high fans, you know. This is what you actually look like, and this is the team you actually need to support. Let them know. Let them know. Uh, ah, yeah, well, days. little thoughts. I'm ready to move on. But um, yeah, sad times. But I think there needs to be there needs to be a lot happening in the scene as well as Overwatch Two is one. Bit of a full reset button on on Tier Two and to take another good look at what oh, its sure. purpose is and what it's there for. Like I'm saying, if the purpose is just to be a feeder league, then it, it should just be an academy league. You know, mm -hmm. just make it an academy league. Um, and then number three, it's like, you know, COVID's an issue and we'll see what happens after COVID. Totally. Agree. Yep. Cool. All right. Uh, let's go on to next topic. So this is where the June Joust dis discussion actually begins. And now now in the in the comment section or in the, <laughs> the description of the VOD, you're like, man, where does this June Joust discussion start? Like they've been talking about Runaway and Tier 2 for like an hour now. Uh, boom, that you've probably just clicked the button. You've just clicked the timestamp and, you know, welcome to the June Joust discussion as <laughs> you missed all the Tier 2 kind of stuff. Um, so overall thoughts first is Dragons versus Fuel Finals. We expect the Fuel to probably be here. Dragons, a lot of people counted out. And we have now got probably the greatest rivalry of this current season in 2021, where Dragons of Fuel play each other in a finals yet again for a stage final. Yep. Yeah. Feeling-wise, like, am I the only one that got, like, real invested in this? Like, I, I feel like I'm normally pretty cold to a lot of these you know, overly curmudgeonly, you know, viewing the games, kind of nitpicking in areas, you know, not super engaged. I got up. I stood up for this one. Oh, right. I was like, what are you talking I, about? Like, what, what yeah, just the feeling, the feeling of this match. I think Eichenwald onwards. It was just like the magic of, you know, some of these rivalries past, you know, when, um, we we have it kind of you know kind of talking about it so i might as well just jump into it like the the shock and the the titans right i think it was rialto where well how did it go yeska the the shock you know barely cap and then titans just like steamroll them or something like that like they just go up yeah, and yeah, above yeah. and beyond like it, yeah. it, it 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 felt very similar to that even even down to the last fight where lips you know i think it was lip kind of yeah. just is brawling on the point and it it's what when does it stop when is it enough how can sparkle do the things that he does why is doha finding all the value um wh what what are they doing with their comp regarding dallas and, and trying to match shanghai on the wrecking ball stuff um it, it had it all and then some and it and yeah it it felt like a final it felt like it should have been an arena it felt like a grand final it, it was it was very it was exciting I mean, mean, it was, season, but yeah, you mean the yeah, season. season wise, season wise, it, it felt like it should have been on stage. It might, be. it was, it, it might be the grand final hopefully, as well. Hopefully, I'll, I'll also straight up tell you, yes, like even if Fuel wins that fight, they probably have two more fights to win or something yeah. after that. And yes, they would have gotten a new time bank because they push it. Mm. They have no business winning that fight. Like Lip rips that out of impossibility with just like yeah. quick, quick three ones. That made no sense. Like I, I uh, went back, watched it again. Then like it's, it's just it, it shouldn't happen. And if you actually carefully watch, this man stands in Death Blossom and he has like seventeen HP or something at one point. Mm -hmm. Like if he drops there, it's just over that fight, and you, you have a new reboot, and you might have a different champion. Like, I think that's that's like an underappreciated point. That I don't know. Like if you look at this Dragons team in hindsight about these players, and I was I was surprised that nobody uh, nobody talked this much about the lip play. 
But the more magical place this this June Joust t- tournament cycle in general, and also in the knockout stages, it, it it feels like the magic was part of the dragon side, wasn't it? This time, like mm-hmm. dragon's it's, magic. It's it starts yeah. with the void three man uh, call down BS that shouldn't catch three people there. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Then then the Lee gone like uh ten uh ten K. <laughs> And then, yeah. then like this lip absolute bullshit. Like I was getting mad well, because you- I had like I had a perfect bracket show. I like. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you did. I, I yeah. And I even had the final four too. I was I was mm. like oh no. After the first two maps, I'm like ah, I'm not getting the map points because they're getting stomped. And then they clap yeah. it back, dude. Like that. <laughs> that that wasn't after. Uh, it was after second control, right after Busan. It was like oh. Oh, is this is this really about to happen? Because it was like a very clear shift. Like Dallas was doing uncharacteristic things. I think in particular, um, I think Fielder got like overly aggressive with a coalescence and just threw it away immediately. Like no, there was no follow up. He was just running map. it down. Yeah, it was it was just and it, really it balanced out by Lee Jagon dying with beats. So they they both balanced. Sure, out yeah. Out. <laughs> but to to Yiska's point, and, and I'm funny, and I'm praying that I'm remembering this right. Wasn't didn't Void have like a really bizarre like five K diva bomb on Rialto at the very yes. end, that where was, like the like, shield just no disappears and no one yeah. talks about this, but Fate actually booped two people into that as well. Oh, so the shield disappears, kills three, and Fate boops the other two into it, okay. and no one talks about Fate's part in that. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I like I again, again, Fate's that. the worst player in the world, right? So no one talks about Fate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the narrative right there. Um. So yeah, I mean, I I kind of want to dive into uh, we'll, we'll dive into the actual nitty gritty part of the match in just a second. But um, speaking of preds, Yeska, uh, we might as well go over some of the preds that we had because I I think I was the only one that actually backed Shanghai. And now before anyone says like, oh, but Avril they didn't even win with the Arista comp and stuff like that. I'm like, okay, fine, I'll give you that point. I get it. They didn't win with that composition, but they did also force uh, they forced the fuel. They forced Fearless to play towards them. And Shanghai came in with really strong teamwork. And by the way, people from last week got really salty about this part. It's like, like me somehow I was saying that because Dragons, I expected Dragons to come with this like huge amount of teamwork. That somehow that Dallas didn't have that. I never said that. I put words in my mouth. Dallas obviously <laughs> have a shitload of teamwork as well. People got really annoyed. It's just like you, you, they're, they're like inserting things that I didn't say. Yeah, lying like by omission. Oh, no. Yeah. N- I said, I said, that, that, I said that Moira, Moira Lucio is like a low skill comp or like a low skill cap comp. And people like what people heard of that because they didn't they didn't listen yeah. to words the comprehension wasn't there they didn't listen to the actual words and what what went through their heads is they heard me say that Dallas was a low skilled team I didn't fucking yeah. say that you need to listen properly I said it was a low skill cap composition and a lot of people a lot of teams play that doesn't yes. mean you can't win with that it's like it succeeds no. because you don't uh, there's less that needs to click for that to happen which is mm-hmm. why eventually Shanghai had to buckle and you know they played as well because like you know what it's gonna take too much to to get this. Arista stuff underway, and every team that tried to play the Arista eventually couldn't get it, uh, get it to happen. Like Atlanta, for example, they're one of the teams that could play both styles well. Um, and eventually, you know, the the Arista stuff just wasn't, they couldn't do it. And I thought they were going to maybe, you know, play the Arista with Kai on the Ash that was going to be good enough. But nope, Dallas, Dallas were way too strong on Lucio Moya, and they ended up overpowering everybody, probably as expected. But I was holding out hope that maybe Shanghai could be the difference maker because they played, you know, so much ash based stuff the fleet mm. uh, the flitter onto the echo with a bit of pocketing and put fate on the wrist and that was looking really good and that was going to be the comp that shanghai would come in and win on shanghai realized that wasn't going to work and then they came in but something else that shanghai did and i said this if shanghai ended up truly mirroring dallas they were going to lose and they knew that as well which is why they didn't play yep. the winston they yep. knew they yep. had to play count which is why if you look at the 03 loss versus dallas i mean they they got stomped there because they they couldn't they were weren't sure what the counter was. They were trying to figure out the counter. They knew they couldn't just play a wrister into it. So they tried like, you know, the torb and the legs and all this other nope. stuff and the brig. They tried like hard anti dive, like hard anti brawl. It's just like you want to come into us, okay, we're gonna give Torb a lot of HP, you're going to be firing the double shotguns here, a, a brig bash and all that kind of stuff, but even then it wasn't good enough because the sustain on Dallas's comp was too high and all that. And eventually they figured out their ball was going to be the answer. And the cool part about it is this is they, they figured that out so quickly and then forced the Dallas field to adapt to them. So the kind of the kind of stuff that I had behind me in terms of realistically, you know, it's not just about comps here. Like we can talk about comps and people are gonna try and pin mm-hmm. that to the wall. Like here's the here's the smoking gun. I got a fucking gotcha, Avril. Here's my fucking smoking gun. It's like, okay, 
you know, that part, sure, we, we, they didn't play the right comp, but this, it's not the only reason I thought Shanghai was going to win. I knew Shanghai had the capability in terms of teamwork and individual skill as well. Like, probably not in the Winston department because no one's going to be as good as Fearless there except maybe Goose Rona's best day. Yeah. But, like, I mean, you look at the other pieces on Shanghai. They got great individual pieces. I still think Lip is like a front runner for best hit scan so far this year, in my opinion. Flit is always going to be insanely got an echo and just a, on a bunch of different heroes. And the entire team, like Voyage Diva was fantastic. I'm yeah. not even talking about the 5K there. That was assisted by a whole bunch of other things. But Void in general working with Flitter to shut down Doha and Sparkle, the way they kind of, you know, turned that into a focus. And Doha was getting less and less done. Sparkle was getting less and less done. Um, Shanghai's ability to to make that happen as a team and their, their, their coordination and their adaptability to work out this meta in like three days to mm. figure it out and then beat Fuel on it, something Fuel perfected in yeah. Shanghai to do in three days, that's impressive. And that's like, that's the kind of Shanghai magic that I was working off of that I knew like, you know, that would come on through. And I just, I hope, let's, let's I'm going to be real. There was a bit of hopium in there. I probably thought sure. that the easy answer would be that Dallas was probably going to win the June Joust, mm. but I wanted to say that Shanghai was going to win it because I wanted to back the APAC teams and I wanted to believe that Shanghai had the capability to make that turnaround happen and to, to eventually get one over. And, you know, I'm glad they did. If they didn't, fine. You know, Dallas wins, doesn't matter. Like, they were probably going to win, but I'll put the spicy, I'll put the spicy print in there because, you know, I'll be different. I'll be just, uh, I'll just, you know, I'll back the APAC teams instead. And that's what I'm going to go for. But, you know, just chill out. Don't get too mad about me printing Shanghai. That doesn't mean I think Dallas are bad. It means I just think I think Shanghai are gonna win based on the reasons I listed. Yeah, yeah, and I like, I think, I generally speaking, like what what you said about the uh, wrecking ball situation. So I think there's this rivalry is exciting because the teams win sort of by samey ways. I would say, in the sense that, like they get beaten early. Once, like, um, uh, something seems strong against them, okay. then they figure yeah. out a process, and it's usually by leaning into their own strength. Mm -hmm. And um, we have a post-match into, uh, sorry, a the uh, Dallas hosted a press conference, and I got to ask questions, and it's, I think it's going to release this week as well. Um, mm -hmm. But basically, Rush mentions that he thought that the wrecking ball. And the fact that they won the way they did was probably also predicated on the maps that they were played. Now, this makes me think that they really dropped the yeah. ball on Busan. Like, that seemed to, to, for me to be the crux of the series, where it's like, A, you're leading 1-0, so, like, you're halfway there. Like, winning the first sub-map, of course, like, it already increases your uh, chance of winning that mm. map, map type. But then, also the manner in which they lost it, not only close, but really sloppy, I feel like that's when the series was derailed. And then the rest, yes, you gotta win those maps, but if I'm Dallas, I'm mad about Busan. Well, I think Shanghai mad about Rialto. My counterpoint to that would be, I think Shanghai probably should have won Rialto, as much Agreed. as Dallas should have won Busan, because you look at Rialto, For sure, um, yeah. it should have been a completed hold on, on C, and it shouldn't have gone to time bank. Um, and there's a lot of shoulda, woulda, couldas here, but if we're mm -hmm. applying that logic to both Busan sure. and Rialto, then mm. we balance it out by saying Shanghai should have won Rialto, Dallas should have won Busan, and we're at the same scoreline. When it came to, th and this is kind of for the both of you, when it comes to like the general feel, when we, we first load into that first control sub map and you see what both teams are running, um, what did it feel like for the both of you? I immediately kind of viewed that as like a strategic white flag from Shanghai as much as yes, the wrecking ball does change a lot. I'm, I'm not saying that it doesn't, but when it comes to like the archetype and what exactly these compositions want to do, you have one team who's had what two days to kind of come up with something against a team that they've already lost to convincing or the team that still is running the same thing that nobody's found out an answer to that looks strikingly similar um, in the way that it works to the, the opposition coming from the lower bracket. Did that kind of come across to you immediately? Did that narrative kind of stick out for the both of you, both of you at all? Can't say it has. I got a short answer. I got a short okay. answer. My short answer is just like, is that I was pretty glad Shanghai were not coming out on anything like soldier kind of picks. Mm. I either wanted them to play like full APAC and just ignore the Lucio Moria and just, you know, pocket flat on the Mercy and do what they did. Sure. Probably then lose on that, whatever. Like, I wouldn't, yeah. I wanted to see them do it. Yeah. 
Um, or I wanted to see them like play a sort of counter cop that they had trust in. So if they come mm. in on the Lucio Moira, but the only difference here is the Wrecking Ball versus, you know, uh, Fearless's Winston, then at that point, they're either waving the white flag or they're saying, no, this is what we can win on. This is the counter comp. This is what we believe is going to be successful. And it took two maps to kind of really see the result of that. Totally. But part of me was like, if there's if there's any way Shanghai going to go out, they're going to go out on what they believe is their best chance to win. Mm. Yep. Jessica, for you, did it, did it feel kind of weird seeing a similar kind of composition? being run for shanghai or did you what did you kind of expect did you I expect mean, them to, they to needed, run some of the stuff that they ran they needed to just come up with something if you get clapped into the ground it wasn't close the first time around yeah like i again like i look at it like a doofus now but i i didn't think they could pull it back from that and sure. for the first two maps it didn't look like they could pull it back no like if you switched off your your stream at that time i'm i'm not mad at you because you mm. made a it wasn't close a, a prediction that comes true ninety percent of the time, right? Probably not with, with the dragons because these guys somehow need to be uh, down two maps in order to start playing, which was also <laughs> yeah. like a thing last season. Um, but yeah, I, I wasn't surprised at um, that they had some wacky stuff. I just pro probably surprised at what it looked like. Um, okay. And when it, go ahead. I, I mean, now it makes sense in the. It's it's strange how this narrative has developed, but like, you know, Fate used to be one of the best wins since season one, right? I I like I know there was this benchmark for good Winston players where it was like about like hitting the mechanical ceiling of getting the the double hits on one juggle. You guys remember that? You had the double fist bump thing, and like there were like four people in the entire Overwatch League that were able to consistently do it. It was like Fissure, Gesture, Fate. I forgot about that. And someone else. And it's it's Probably strange. Just, oh, wait, he didn't play in season one. Never yeah, mind. true. Yeah. It's like now, like it's it's strange to see Fate get gapped on that now, even though it's mm -hmm. been freaking four years now. Like, I mean, it makes some sense. It is just strange for me that Ball is now his pick. That makes it yeah. a little weird for me. I okay, especially I don't know if that's his, but that's a team's pick. That's agree. like Moon saying, I think Ball's the counter here and Fate's like, all right, let's do it. Yeah, 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 for sure. It definitely allows them to do a lot, not to completely jump ahead. Yiska, please finish your point. No, like my point is like I think while he didn't MTD, I I already hate it. <laughs> like wait like <laughs> You see, like you feel a dirty, five, need a shower. five percent higher, uh, dirtiest word like esports performance on on the one thing. Like people are so mm. they they love that those words, right? Like it's like yeah. But we also they want it to know be what super binary. You, you pick the winning team. You're like MTD, yeah. <laughs> the team that won MTD. The other team just like that in a vacuum, like always. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, it's fun. It's also kind of old now, and unfortunately. Like after you, you know when you you do stuff ironically you know like when when you're like I don't know like doing a, a joke ironically you saw something really cringy and you do it ironically and suddenly it's in your language and you mean it now yep this is basically MTD now like where people are actually like on the slightest differences in the <laughs> in those situations go, just come out with that right it's so like if one tank ever kills another one it's just like MTD like oh, people MTD, just throw it in for yeah. everything it's like it's like C9 where like anytime anyone doesn't yes. camp out C9 it yep. doesn't matter what the context is always C9 yeah, yeah. now it's like whenever a tank dies one of the tanks always MTD no matter what and the problem is that half of these guys mean it like it's not even that it's <laughs> yeah. memes right like yeah. they're not just late to the to the fun and are lame about it. Like they, that's actually your cognition now. That like the meme has successfully integrated into your DNA. Oh, okay. You are this now, right? So, um, yeah. I, but I don't think that's the reason. Like I don't, I don't think fate gapped uh, fearless on ball. Oh, but um, it's still. I mean, there's not many players that can were or have been able to maintain. The level of consistency that have that fate has and relevance that fate fate has had since season one, right? With admittedly yeah, yeah, like a struggle bus season, right? The, the problem yeah. is the narrative for fate is because everyone compares him to fearless because he replaces fearless. Sure, that's like yes. the crux of the narrative. Everyone's like, "Well, he's clearly worse than fearless." Like, <laughs> yeah, so is every other main tank of the league. 
well, what's your point? Like, if anyone who replaces Fearless is going to look worse than Fearless. Yeah. And that's that's kind of where it starts. And people are like, you know, the, the, I think that's a lot of where the, the hate for fate begins. And mm-hmm. I hope it yeah. broke the fanboy's brain now that they saw their, you know, like, godlike tank player lose, that they realized that there are other people. Like, it's not like mm-hmm. you don't read Fearless on the scoreboard. It's not automatically MTD. I promise you it's not. Like, yep. I, I, and again, I think that extends to more main tanks in the league as well. Oh, 100%. When you, to kind of jump on the Fearless point, when you look at their last season, again, a very successful season, um, Fearless was not a, a main, like a, a main starting player, right? Like he did play a good chunk of the season, but there were definitely heroes where Coach Moon decided he was Hog. not going to be the starter, right? Hog, Orissa. Stand one Hog. Yeah, it's, it was, it was very clear that he was not fit for some of these things. I think fate and the vast majority of heroes is the more consistent player, right? Um, it, it doesn't surprise me that, you know, fate ended up on this team. Um, Boone's worked with him before. Fate is a great player. What was kind of surprising to me was the return to ball for him. Because if you remember the start of this specific tournament, fate, did not play ball incredibly well. Um, if anything, it was it was pretty rough around the edges. A lot of criticism, especially from my direction, um, towards him on ball. Um, and it did kind of, if anything, that that first semifinal where they kind of get clapped three zero and they're trying all these different kind of things and and throwing you know Dallas all these all these different looks. It seemed like the wrecking ball was the one thing that kind of shined through because you could do a lot with it, right? You saw Fate, especially in a lot of these later series or a lot of these later maps, um, consistently be able to kind of displace Fearless as he's jumping. And I remember a couple uh, boops on Volskaya, uh, second as well as I think Eichenwald as well, where he's just always either interrupting or, or playing the objective or setting up Fleta for a dive. Like the the flexibility of that specific hero in the, the Dallas fuels, if we're going to call it that, composition. Um, w- was so hyper flexible, and to see somebody who is kind of struggling with it early on step into that role, look improved, and also show so many different looks where he's playing the objective, he's flanking, he's setting people up, he's he's displacing on an engage, he's landing all kinds of you know fat slams, right? It 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 was really really pleasant to see. I don't know if it's. I it, it it's it's kind of like one of those the Shanghai magic scenarios where it, it still begs belief for me that that could be a consistent thing for this player. And it's not unlike fate to do something like that, but I don't know if that's going to be something that they can kind of count on. Right. So and this is like we're, we're definitely into Shanghai discussion at the moment where yeah. it's you are you're kind of referring to the difference between the 0 and 3 start to the tournament, the actual tournament phase versus how we ended. Right. If I'm reading that correctly, uh, or hearing that I mean, correctly. sort of. I mean, I definitely am drawing on like the idea that going into the qualifiers, I think Shanghai struggled with ball, particularly because I think they played ball. It, it might have not been June early, but it may have been in May. I know specifically like, this season, Shanghai. Yeah, I, I well, thought May, fate has been in in May. They there was ball play across the board. Uh, okay. uh, then maybe it was of the way the meta was, but I I don't really remember them playing a lot of ball at all. I think they played like five minutes point. or something uh, against. So. Um, but if we talk and about, it might not. It might not have been. Been. Like yeah, Fate's ball wasn't going to do much in that original zero and three um, winning semi final where like their team is playing guess who like just with different compositions like is it the guy yeah. with the glasses? Yeah. Uh, is it the guy with the black hair? No, not that one. Uh, is it the guy with the mustache? And then by the end of it, you know, they figured out maybe the ball was good. They're like, maybe it is the guy with the mustache. And you know, that's how they figured mm. out the, the, the guess who. And they got it right. They, they did guess who. Um, <laughs> the problem is you had so many versions where it's just like you have this ball with a brig with a torb. Sure. Yeah. And then it's just like they tried out so many different things. It was all getting crushed. Um, and then, you know, they, they tried out a ball with a soldier. And it's just like, yeah, the ball's not going to work until you land on the specific. No, it has to be Echo, Reaper, Ball. Uh, Diva, Lucio, Moira, it has to be these exact six heroes, and that's kind of where we landed. And if I'm gonna, if I, you know, to drop some analysis on why, why I think the ball ended up working, as I, you know, asked a few coaches and did, you know, rewatch it a little bit myself and to really analyze it, um, it's a, it's a good counter into the Lucio Moira mirror. I say mirror hesitantly because 
Yeah, it's not a true mirror because there's a wince on the right. other side. This comp, I think, sucks generally versus like anything else. Like if you were going to play this into a double shield, you probably want the Winston instead of the ball, maybe. I'm mm. thinking that. I think generally the Winston probably is better, especially Primal is a really good, great ultimate, especially in the hands of then someone like Fearless. But mm. versus that Winston version of the Lucio Morium, um, it's the fact that th this comp stacks up so hard, your consistency in getting four to five to six man like pile drives is really high like every single fate pile drive is like minimum three people yeah. if not more like i'm seeing regular four to five man pile drives all the time and that disrupts tempo because so much of this mirror comp re uh, revolves around tempo play you want to go first you don't want to be the team receiving the dive or just receiving the push in you want to be the team rushing in first and initiating first and setting the tempo of that fight um and if the ball disrupts that tempo in any sort of way that that makes things difficult because it forces cooldowns every single time you you slam into the right plays field that instantly has to use fade or somebody you know jixxer has to boop or he has to speed or he has to do x or y mm -hmm. and carbon's gotta he's gotta instantly you know throw out some defensive matrices and people gotta do things you're, you're forcing cooldowns almost immediately um and then you're comboing up with stuff like every most of the power drives i see flitter immediately trucks and stickies onto a player and gets yep. a very low play and that usually is sparkle there's a lot of mm -hmm. situations where you pile drive in stickies on a sparkle beam them down because echo receives no healing in this comp echo receives fuck all healing like none so echo is like one of the easiest targets in that kind of situation where you've actually landed successful cc to then secure a kill on and there's a lot of focus when i was watching shanghai in terms of what they were doing there's a lot of focus between flitter and void on the echo diva combo to either get doha pressured or sparkle pressured and to find that initial pick off in that kind of way and if you go back to busan i think mecha base is a clear example this is in the grand finals you see fate kind of slamming in sparkle instantly dying and that's how they get the 6v5 I think that's that's literally the first kill of the the grand finals, especially on uh, it wasn't Ilios, it was uh, Li Shang. Um, I think literally the first person to die in this grand finals was Sparkle for the reasons you're mentioning, right? I I don't know if it's necessarily with a fate pile, pile driver follow up um, from Fleta, but there was a very clear and definitive, you know, target put on Sparkle, and you see him die quite often. Um, you know, early in these fights and, and yeah. putting Dallas kind of in a in an early grayish. Why goes Doom later? Because he's trying yeah. to counter the ball as well. He's like, I'm getting slammed. I'm getting yeah. wrecked on this yeah. Echo. I need to go something else. And he's trying to counter ball with Doom. And that's, you know, when you see, that's Dallas waving the white flag. When you see them changing Fearless to yep. Hog on Icon and then changing yep. back to Ball on Icon and then yeah, yeah, eventually yeah. Sparkle that's... goes on Doom and Doha goes yeah. over towards Echo. You're like, that's the white flag for Dallas for sure. Yeah. Again, that that's, that's the type of Shanghai magic, which I, I will circle back to this, that... It, it, again, it just is so surprising that finally, after again, 3 ing them, right? Or 3 0 ing them, Dallas Fuel advances without much effort. Shanghai comes in and forces them to bend the knee, right? They're the ones to kind of wave the strategic white flag and say, look, we don't know how to deal with this. So we're either going to throw some wacky stuff at you with the Roadhog, we're going to mirror you. Fearless kind of looks out of sorts on Junker Town kind of just swinging around trying to play flanks it doesn't necessarily work out um i think they were successful and you know kind of wrapping up with with dallas a little bit um they were they definitely had if if you know sparkle had a target for shanghai then for dallas it was it felt very clearly to me that forcing out lips cooldowns very very early and getting him off the table or, or kind of mitigating his pressure that he could kind of provide um, felt very clear for for Dallas among you know like you said acting first and I think that's something that you know the wrecking ball does give Shanghai they they don't have to necessarily play reactionary they can do a lot of different things right they can wanna, swing in from the back like it's super flexible in first. I want to get Yiska's take just after this or just in a second but I just want to add one thing because yeah. I forgot about this and I want to put it in here sure. so that people understand for for the people that thought I doubted Dallas is like <laughs> did you guys forget that I had Dallas winning in the semifinals like I did say shanghai we're going to come through the lower bracket i didn't say mm -hmm. that i want to lose the first match versus dallas because they're not going to be ready for this lucio moria they're not going to be ready for what dallas bring to the table and then they have to come through the entire lower bracket and then eventually get the win that that has to be the pathway for shanghai and that that is the one part that i'm going to stand by that i felt like i read very correctly outside mm -hmm. of compositions we can you know Sorry. ignore that part for a second i just feel like in terms of narrative in terms of how it's going to be done it was going to be via that um and to sort of you know close up my final thoughts on ball as well um it's also because balls hard to punish there's nothing here that counters ball 
you, Lucio and Moira, like what counters ball here? All the balls good counters are gone. There's no tracer to chase ball down. There's no Sombra to hack the ball. There's not even a May to freeze the ball. You're not playing a break to stun the ball. Um, you're not playing anything to stop the ball whatsoever. The only thing that can really affect the ball is Reaper if you can get yes. some good shots off while he's slamming. Uh, but then he just rolls away anyway. Or like an Echo if you can try and follow up with a beam, but he just adaptive shields and rolls away. You just cannot punish this ball. Whereas the Winston can be punished. He jump if he jumps in and he doesn't have primal and his bubble's gone, there's not enough healing, there's no coal, he's pretty much dead, like there's no reset there. Um Winston's white and has always been way more punishable than ball. So that's also a good read from Moon and Fate. But uh yeah, that that'll conclude my thoughts on Shanghai. Yes, yeah. <sighs> yeah, I, I think what I wonder is the following scenario. Okay. And I guess this is a question I would also pose to you. Let's say Fuel lose the first match. Do you think that okay. final looks very differently? Because they are then yeah. the ones that have to adapt? But in which way? Yeah, I don't think... I, what do you mean, have to adapt? Right. If, if Fuel were to lose in a convincing fashion, mm -hmm. I don't know... Just any fashion... Sure, in any fashion, if it's close, it's close. But if Shanghai starts with the correct idea, but maybe it's a little rough around the edges, maybe the teamwork, maybe the coordination, resource management, whatever it is. But if they win that match, it's that messages to me that it's very clear that they found a solution, maybe not the best solution, but their own solution, whether that's the Wrecking Ball, Arissa, what have you. Um, and, and if they were to rematch in the grand finals, I don't see that... Um, falling apart right i still think that continues if anything it probably improves um i don't think atlanta it, it was strong enough to be able to topple either of those teams um regardless of who won um but yeah if if shanghai were to have won that i would say that they probably would have won that grand finals uh, more convincingly hmm. i'm not so sure i think okay dallas was already in the process of sort of figuring it out i think um Specifically, Junk Up Tom was reasonably close. Uh, also, pretty messy, to be fair. Um, yeah. Oh, that's another point. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, f I feel like this, like the dynamic of these two teams is that they need a little bit of time to mull it over. And oh, 100%. Presented with the problem Im immediately. I don't know. Like, I feel like the two day separation could have changed the outcome of this match considerably. Even though, to be fair, like it was already ridiculously close, right? Like, uh, yeah, of course. I mean, this was like a 55-45 game in, in, in how it played mm -hmm. out, right? Like in many other parallel universes, uh, Dallas Fuel is, uh, is the winner of this match, right? But yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. Like, I didn't see that coming, to be fair, just like from, from the ability of this team to bounce back in that regard. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe I should have expected as much as after my melee. Maybe, maybe that's an underestimation. Um, it's possible. It's it's also I will also say the fact that these two teams made it here is very unlikely to be a, a statistical anomaly based on no, not anymore the volatility in the system, right? Like yep. you have like you don't have double a limb b before getting to a Y. You mm. have like the uh, volatility of hero pools. Uh, you have very few qualification matches which you need to win. You just got to have mm -hmm. a certain consistency and ability to read new metas pretty quickly. And both of those teams making the final again, uh, even at that small sample size, is almost feeds more of a demonstration of, of their ability to get there. And 100%. It, like, if we are indeed going back to the other, to the um, main melee meta, which I'm not sure we will, but we can talk about that as well. Um, hmm. I don't see a reason why these guys shouldn't meet again in the finals. Yep, that'd be my Somebody's... favorite. No, oh, without yeah. a doubt. And, and I think you... I'll, yeah. I'll answer your question from earlier as well, Jessica. I think it depends. You you were asking like if Shanghai win in the semifinals instead of feel, would we see the same result in the grand finals? And I think that there's a couple of you know caveats there in terms that we got to figure out. Do Shanghai win? With this ball comp, have they figured yeah. it out by now? Mm -hmm. Do they figure it out day one or not? Or do they or do they win while experimenting? Do they win while playing guess who? And just so it happens like, oh, I got the guy with the mustache on my first guess. Who knew? Um, <laughs> uh, it's, it's what what actually happens there because if they're I'm saying if they're playing guess who on their compositions, they're probably not going to win. So they probably have to have figured out the ball straight away. They have to have been very yes. confident in their lead up to 
Jun Jiao's like, this is the comp. In that case, then you see Dallas go through the lower bracket with Shanghai in mind um, as, you know, this is what we got to prep for. Um, mm -hmm. But my then follow-up question would be, well, who ends up in the lower bracket? Did, did Atlanta beat Shanghai? We'll assume no. So no. Atlanta go down and face Dallas. Did, do Atlanta then play the ball as well? Does, do we see some gator ball? Um, but then, you know, do they... Is that going to be an, that, op an yeah, opportune time for Dallas to kind of figure it out as well? Because I think Shanghai also used Atlanta to kind of refine it further. Because sure. you see them over the course of the tournament as they go through Dallas and then New York and then Atlanta, then finally back to Dallas. Uh, through those games in the middle between New York and Atlanta, they start refining this ball comp and nailing it down to exactly what works. And they use those two specific games as practice to get this mm -hmm. ball comp working in this Lucio Moyo comp sure. overall which is part of the turnaround. It's so like they figured this out within like two matches, losing to Dallas and beating those other two teams. And Atlanta, the Atlanta matches, I think, where, where Shanghai clicked. That's when they're like, okay, this is definitely working now. This is what we got to stick with. Uh -huh. And that's the belief they come into. So I think with Dallas, that the similar pathway would have to happen, right? They would have to get past Atlanta convincingly, have a counter comp ready. That's if they are going to counter in terms of Atlanta also playing the ball, because Atlanta then convinced that the ball's the right pick as well. Um, but I don't know. I don't know if Atlanta do that. I think... Based on what we saw from Atlanta Fuel, they ended up playing their standard stuff. Um, and I think Atlanta probably wouldn't have gone for the ball. I don't know if Gator wants to go ball anyway. I think yeah. Gator would much prefer either Winston or maybe definitely Orissa. Yep. Um, and then Dallas would have to kind of have that counter ready. But I don't even know if they have a counter because it's more like they were trying to figure out an answer. And their answer was fearless go ball or maybe fearless go hog or yeah. maybe go doom. But I think doom is just worse than echo anyway. So I don't even think that's like a good counter. I think yeah. the only way Dallas have any chance of then beating um, Shanghai in that matchup is either they refine their Winston's version of the Lucio Moria further to work around the fact that there's a ball in the field, or they just say, you know what, fearless, you go ball as well. We're just going to play full mirror. We're going to play ball versus ball and see what happens. And then all the Dallas fans who think fearless could MTD, maybe he could on the ball. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. No, that's fair. I think, uh, when I mean, the butts and nips are, are always, like in my mind, it's just of like... Course. Um, yes, the complexity of that is probably true. It's just the, the there's a, a gigantic uncertainty about what there could be done to counter the ball more, right? Um, and if there's sure, anything but are in you gonna are you that, gonna put that? Also, if you do that, then Shanghai just plays something. Like it's like when you try to counter. Yes. It's like when we look at May Mela and you try to counter Sparkle Symmetra, then he just goes doom. Right, mm -hmm. I think I think if you try and play ball there, and then I don't know. I think there's not that's not even a counter. That's just saying when you whenever you just play the exact same comp as the other team, you're not trying to counter anymore. You're just trying to meet parity. Um, so I think if yes. if Dallas went out of their way to do, like one of the biggest ball counters available, they're just like, nope, it's time to play a May now. We're gonna have to really it's time to play May Brig because that's all we got. There's no there's no tracer. There's no Sombra. Um, then at that stage, Shanghai, like, well, we're just going to change our comp to something a little bit more normal. Maybe it's time to play Double Shield now. Maybe it's time to play Rizzle. Who knows? We get into, like, this entire, you know, rabbit hole of who picks what yeah, yeah, this rock, sure. paper, scissors at that point. Yeah, for sure. Do you really want to ask that of the team that is basically one trick with, you know, maybe 30 minutes to an hour on other heroes? Um, that's, that's the biggest, you know, predicator for me. For this team, if they were to come through the lower bracket, yes, they're a team that can refine things and, and definitely change on the fly. We've seen that in the past, um, like with Avril saying with regards to May Melee, but with this this team, with the practice they've got in, again, having to travel to Hawaii, I'm sure they don't have a ton of practice coming into it, right? Um, well, it's, everyone probably. It, it's tough. Um, I mean, sure, yeah, t definitely not a ton um, from the Apex side, but seeing how you don't have to travel, I'd definitely say that they've probably got a couple more. You know, yeah, but they it. had to do. They had to travel the other way though. They had to travel from the Hangzhou homestand stand no, that's back true. to their base in Guangzhou. I just, I actually realized they're based in Guangzhou, not in Shanghai for whatever reason. But that's inside. <laughs> they had to travel back then, where they said they lost sure. time. Um, okay, and that kind of yeah. stuff. So there was some traveling because they had to go to a homestand and come back and sure. all that's that fair. kind of stuff. Um, but you know the and, and I did say, and this is something I said last episode that wasn't meant to sound. Like I'm, I'm shitting on the field and thing, but they are a one trick team. I think you got to admit that. I think even a yeah. field fan should admit that. And before you say like, oh, well, the Dallas, you, know, you can play Doom. That means they're not a one trick team. It's like, no, but you're still playing the same comp, aren't you? Yeah. Um, you're not really 
showing different flavors here like and, and just for the record the doom doesn't do enough there doesn't it's, change it's, a it's whole straight lot. up worse than the echo you're yeah. not playing anything that actually improves your combat at that stage you're just trying to work around the ball because the, your echo is getting slammed and then sticky the entire game and you know sparkles yeah. dying because of that yeah. um so no they they kind of are a one-trick team and that's the sort of good and that's not me to speak ill of the team that's just me saying no, they can't do much what they are. this is the most that they can do and that's partially, and I have a theory as well. I have this kind of speculative theory of that. That's kind of what defined the NA meta. Because whenever this is, this always happens with hero pools. When there's a hero pool coming out, and there's limited mm. amount of time and games to figure out the meta, you're gonna play what works immediately. You're gonna play what you're good at and what gets the most success. And then as soon as the team starts winning with that, other teams are gonna start copying it because they're like, well, if this is working, then it must be for a good reason. And well, we're just gonna do what other teams kind of do. Um, and in APAC, that's team saying, yeah, we're not going to change too much. We're already good at this comp. Let's just keep winning with, you know, uh, Echo and playing some Ash in there, throwing some double shield, maybe some of that kind of stuff. And every other team's like, all right, that sounds pretty good. And then in NA, Dallas are the best team. They bring out this Lucio Moria and they start beating other teams. And other teams are like, well, I guess we have to play this now. And that's kind of my opinion. Speculator, you know, I speculate on that's kind of how the two metas have developed in their own regions. Um, yeah. And I find it thematic as well, by the way. If you think about how Shanghai won Jun Zhao's versus how they won Stage 3 a couple of years ago when they defeated Goats, it's kind of yeah. like they were the ones being like, we're not going to play Goats, we're going to figure the Goats counter out, and we're going to find, we're going to kill this composition. Less drastic, but... Less drastic, yeah. but to me, they're like the same... Same, same feeling, for sure. The themes were there, that were there were like, they, to be fair, this time they kind of played into it. This time they kind of, you know, they had to, you know dip their hands into the blood a little bit and get themselves dirty to get there. A little bit, a little bit. They did have to get, they did get there eventually. But you touched on a, a fantastic point that I think was, I, I was slow to agree with um, as we we're watching this, this live and, and our watch party, you know, tune in and whenever there's live games on, we're usually in the, the sure. discord. So we've probably got links somewhere or go down below and, and join up. It's a good little community. Um, it, it did feel like a calculated gamble from moon's perspective. Um, more so when it comes to the versatility of ball and, and how the tempos were very, very different or could choose to be very different. Uh, but that's a tangential point. Um, but this calculated gamble going, you know, we, we saw the stat card with Dallas versus Arisa comps, right? They, they just weren't, un they, they went unbeaten, right? Like if you played Arisa against them, they very clearly knew how to dispatch mm -hmm. it. Do I have opinions on that? Yes, we're not going to get into those. However, if you look at, you know, the, the overall narrative regarding Dallas's comp, it is the, the ease of execution, right? It, it, you can get very strong fundamentals, very strong target focus, really kind of work on where and how you're, you're placing your resources pre-fight. But the mid-fight kind of is just kind of super DME, super scrappy, just rush something down. Hopefully you get it out. You know, the, the pre-fight is about trying to set up the target, right? Whether you get a Wraith out early, whether you get a Fade out early, what, what have you, right? Maybe an early shield um, from the Winston. If you see a statistic that, that shows such a poor matchup versus Arissa, are you really going to run that? Or do you kind of play into it a little bit? Which, again, Wrecking Ball isn't necessarily a mirror. But do you match them in terms of some of the tempo and say, we're going to meet you where you are, and gamble against you in this just chaos ridden mid fight everything anything can happen it's so all over the place there's diva bombs coming out every kind of orifice and and hole on the map god damn is that more successful and i think that definitely played into it is it a direct mirror no 100 when you look at the tempo of each of these comps right shanghai has a wide variety of things if anything they were probably more reactive overall throughout both series um, but you did see them on maps in, in positions where they had map control, especially with the Wrecking Ball, when they're able to just kind of like have fate fall on them, right? If they have high ground control and they're pushing a card or maybe they have control on, you know, a sub map where they can kind of engage from the high ground or they have engaged tools to be able to follow up on. They can change the tempo. They can kind of throw like a change up pitch, let's say, um, and, and really kind of set the Dallas fuel off kilter. They can also be super aggressive and try to, you know, force the tempo and be the first act um i i do want to drive home the point that wrecking ball does kind of blow this composition open um even though on its face it looks very very similar what shanghai showed here and again more credit to fate I, I, you know i think he deserves it and i think moon if anything deserves you know the kind of mastermind of all of this 
the the variety of this composition yeah. was really the key to me um yes it was a calculated gamble it was chaos but the different looks really kind of sold me towards the end of it and again a very specific counter to only what what mm -hmm. the dallas comp like a, this is not a comp that you would see generally run across the board to nope. beat everything it's a very you know a hard counter like this is where you've research the other team very specifically like where how do we take this part and you need great teamwork and coordination to pull that off as yep. well where just a ball slamming in doesn't work you need a ball slamming in with xyz things also happening with your team yep. to engage on that um yes okay, final thoughts on either dallas shanghai or the entire grand final before we move on to atlanta and new york no just glad that it, we once again had a great final uh, i think we yeah, were blessed fantastic. with I just like transport these please into season finals for once. So we got a good one yeah. for once. Like, <laughs> we need a good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's that's my wish. But yeah, otherwise, like highly entertained at the moment. And by the way, you wouldn't. I don't think you get this unless you have. And this will be my final thought on the grand finals. You don't get this unless you have like two separate regions where they come together at the yes. end. This might not be land, but it's close. Um, right. And you have this kind of stylistic matchup, and then you have the Shanghai comeback story where they have to figure right. out this Dallas counter in like mm -hmm. a few days. That storyline does not exist if they all just play in the same space. Yep. So the separate meta, the separate region thing is, I think, insanely good and needs to, that needs to continue on forever in Overwatch League. Um, speaking of separate regions, we also had Atlanta and New York who faced up and they all played each other's different games as well. Start with Atlanta here, where early on Dallas beat Sh uh, Shanghai 3-0. Atlanta beat New York 3-0 as well. And on day one, NA completely stomped APAC 3-0, 6-0 across the board. Um, Hunter had a spicy take on that, which I think is pretty funny. I, I get We're like friends, yeah. and I get his humor. Um, it's a little bit BM, but I get his humor, so it's fine. But um, yeah, NA teams look dominant from day one. And I think Atl but, you know, Atlanta beating New York is probably not hugely unexpected. Um, and Atlanta were, in my opinion, probably the one team, especially coming from NA, that had good capability to play a lot of things across the board they can play the arista stuff because gator on arista that's a known hero for him kai coming on an ash it's like a it's like a good combination they can definitely play that style and then they can also go and just put edison on the uh in the reaper and they can do what dallas do as well yeah it's if anything i think na can kind of put a feather in their cap regarding like the the overall like archetype win right like they, they come into this tournament they they show that this is the composition that that can provide you know meaningful success and and something that you know was answered but you know in its own kind of variation if we're gonna give it um, a name right it was a variant on the Dallas comp that beat Dallas um, and and Atlanta kind of showed that and it was a little surprising as we advance a little bit farther but like you said um, Atlanta New York it wasn't super surprising and um, that result again New York kind of by the grace of the the scrim bucks whoever whatever deity you pray to um they 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 find their way here in in a bizarre fashion and i don't think they were prepared to to deal with this composition um even in apac i think spark ran a little bit of a a variant of their own with Zari and stuff opinions aside it just yeah it was a little rough um kind of expected but yeah when it came to atlanta um sort of surprising not to see them on Arissa due to what you said avril like the, their their comfort really was some of it just some not. just not as much as i would have particularly liked especially on escort which i'm going to continue beating my drum on i think that map pool especially um could have provided um, long-term success for for somebody like kai and and this team that you know seems to have their bread buttered when it comes to Arissa diva style uh Meta games. Maybe there wasn't enough time. Maybe again, they also had to do a Shanghai where it's like it's probably best to just actually, patch them and scrap Atlanta it out. Played Arissa on all three maps they beat in YXL. On. I've just gone through and just looked at all the comps. Sure. So they actually played Arissa the entire time versus New York. I don't know if you needed to really get all kind of crazy with them. Um, I know that they ran it against Dallas on, or they ran a variant of it on uh, Volskaya point A with like the Torb and stuff and. I thought that was something that they could pull out or a look that they could just kind of throw out on specific maps. Full sky, maybe not necessarily the, the, the most, um, the, the, the one map that kind of jumps out at you, but the lack of Kai, I think definitely hurt them, um, regarding like lethality and explosiveness. I think having the ability to just kind of like open a fight with a pick is, is fantastic. And I think if you, if given enough time, I think Atlanta probably does refine down a style or a comp that, you know, 
maybe doesn't beat, but can can kind of hang and, and be competitive yeah. with this Dallas fuel composition. You know, it's funny. Um, I think I think Atlanta ran more richer than Shanghai did over the course yeah, of the tournament. Yeah, hundred percent. I think it, Shanghai came out with like a, like you said, like all the leg stuff, and while it was you know interesting theoretically, it just never kind of landed. Um, the one thing that I will say about Atlanta is that it, it did seem like Pelican was a lot quieter, and I think that's not unsurprising with you with what you saw during their their play in qualifiers. I thought he got away with murder, and that was a big kind of question mark for me: is were these teams going to adequately shut him down? And I think he performed well, but I don't think he was allowed to kind of just run around and, and just be dominant in in certain situations. You also, like you said um, in the last show. Um, you didn't have that kind of extremely potent second threat in Kai Edison, you know, bless him. He just didn't have the same kind of impact that Kai does. It's, it's difficult for anybody to really have that kind of impact. That's no discredit towards him, but, um, yeah, I think they, they definitely looked a little out of sorts. Um, I would have wished to see them on the Arissa, but you know, it's, it's tough to kind of go out on your shield in that way, especially when you have such a, a close, you know a good chance to maybe uh, make a, a stab at the playoffs. I think I think they just they brought the Arisa out versus Field. They won the Arisa versus NYXL. Yeah. They brought it out versus Field and then realized this just wasn't gonna work versus the Field. Because you have on one hand, at the time the best Lucio Moria team in the world. 100%. And then and then you have NYXL who had to practice this comp for this tournament, who had never played this comp. I, I remember looking over all the NYXL games and even Castle Day Pack as well. I was like I, NYXL never played this man. They played like Laura on McCree and, and Double Shield and all sorts of other compositions, but they never mm-hmm. did this Lucio Moria stuff. It just wasn't. And, and Owl history is consistently continuing to be very passive and slow. Like they they seem to just want to thrive and and these kind in of New bunkery. York? Yeah, what are you talk about right New York in particular. Like they want to be super slow. They want to be very not passive, but you know very resource heavy. Yeah. I, I think you know, like Excel should have stuck to their guns. They they should have been the team that have been like, man, we don't have enough time to practice this. We're just going to just we weird. Just come out on the Arisa, and then they could just play Arisa Mirror into Atlanta. Maybe they win, maybe they lose. They probably probably lose because Kai at Pelican is just too good. Mm-hmm. But, um, probably is a lot closer. You, you know what? You, and this is the thing as well. You want to you want to know where Atlanta wave their white flag? It's when they have to sub Kai out, bring it a certain to play yep. Reaper, and then just like succumb to the Lucio Moira pure mm-hmm. mirror. And at that stage. Yeah, look, maybe Gator does get MTD by Fearless in the Winston in, in department and then the rest of the team as well. Like, you don't get to see Iris on his BAP anymore and all this kind of stuff. You're playing Lucio Moira now. And credit to Hawk actually did a reasonable job on the Diva. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, you that that style of Atlanta, I feel like, you know, they weren't they weren't going to beat Fuel in that mirror. No one yeah. was going to beat Fuel in that mirror. No. Not even Shanghai could beat Fuel in that mirror. And so if Atlanta couldn't get it done on that Arisa comp, they probably weren't going to beat the fuel. And then, I mean, versus a team like Shanghai, Shanghai have shown themselves to be more than capable on the double shield, on the hit scans, Lips Ash has been dominant. Um, and then they can, then they've also on top of that Moon and the rest of the squad figured out to play the balls as well, which Atlanta, I don't know that they got there. Um, but credit to this part of the criticism, uh, which was correct, is that like, okay, sure, the, the Arisa comps didn't win at the end of the day, and I thought they would be superior, ended up mm. just being too hard. And I think that's more speaking to the quality of Dallas's counterplay versus it than the actual comp in a vacuum itself. Because I think sure. the comp in a vacuum, I mean, depending on the team you're playing against, I mean, Atlanta can bring out Arisa three maps in a row and 3 0 NYXL. But again, NYXL aren't super practiced on that Lucian yeah. Morris stuff versus a team that have masters of that, like Dallas different story and obviously then maybe the risk gets crushed because dallas are simply too good so yeah you can have a point on that one guys the better <laughs> comp I, no, okay not the better comp but the comp that succeeded i'm 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 not gonna say it's the better comp it's just the comp that succeeded is the lucio moria and no before you say like oh if it succeeded isn't the better comp i mean you got to look at way more stuff than that i don't i don't think you can, that's the same argument as like oh, the team win isn't isn't the main tank the mtd didn't they mtd if they want like that's not the you didn't look enough you didn't we don't mm. looking at enough stuff there you know, we you love results-based like, analysis. Yeah, you can't just be results. Or you can't just be like, oh, if a team won, then they're, they're clearly yeah. just better in all the guys. Like, all six players are all better than all six other players, and their comp was clearly superior in this and that. It's just like, no, mm. that's not entirely true. You have to, you know, get a little bit deeper into that. But I, I still think, like, at the end of the day, Dallas was so damn good on this comp that they were just not going to lose on it unless Shanghai came in with a hard counter. I'm uh, not even a hard counter, but, like, a stylistic specific yeah. counter. Um, if it was any other team that wasn't Dallas, which was Dallas that didn't master this Lucio Moria enough, then maybe the Arisa comp could have worked. Yep. 100%. I, I do think, and I stand by the idea that 
if given enough time, I do think an Arisa style probably would have emerged. There just wasn't enough, you know, games to be played, especially when we look at when it started to come into vogue right as the, the play ins start happening. It's, you know, there's no time there. So what are you going to do? You know, I think to kind of tease a tangentially related topic, maybe for another day, um, I think this spans esports um, in general regarding like ease of ease of execution versus like theoretical best. Right. I think it, yeah. it, it's a big topic in league. What's, what's easier to get in, what's easy to play rather than like what could be the best if everything's clicking. Yep. But yep. Um, sometimes what's easier to play is what's going to be more successful. So if we want to talk about what's more successful, then I will say 100%, no doubts about it. I'm not going to fight this at all. Lucia Moore is a more successful composition. Um, and that, that can be the end of that. Um, for anyone asking, by the way, because I know people were like kind of questioning this and like kind of weird about this and you know, we're, we're, was putting this under the microscope and everyone's like saying like, oh, we're not getting enough out of Yiska. Just remember, Yiska's actually doing production here. So he's got a lot high of... High value. Play. High value, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> to, get, to bring Yiska in, like, Yiska, I, what, what do you... You know, before we move on to NYXL a little bit more, what do you got on Atlanta? Um, I, I, I thought it was interesting that they were so confident in themselves that how they um, conducted themselves. Like, I did a post-match interview mm. with... Um, with Kai, for instance, and he was like, you know, towards the end, it was actually a little bit too easy. We shouldn't have won this easily. And to be fair, I mean, we, we kind of pointed out last episode that there Which was... Which match a was that? So, sorry? Which match was that? Uh, that was against NYXL. Atlanta Shock, right? No, no. Was it versus Shock? No, it was against NYXL, pretty sure. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, it was oh, a post-match right. interview and um, after... Because he was up late. Person. Yes. And like, um, they they must have felt very confident in their ability to uh, both beat Dallas and Shanghai. And to be fair, during that time, I feel like a lot of people were talking about Atlanta now being the favorite after the NYXL match. Then again, like I also think like NYXL is not a great, you know, hurdle to jump over. Not a great litmus test. Like it's like it's exactly with NYXL the the thing that we talked about, right? But. Okay, here's my soapbox, right? You know how Anter made the tweet? About... Yeah. So, and then he humorously pulled it back. I'm bringing it up, right? So, Anter was like, ha ha ha, it's like, the, the APEC region is so weak, blah blah blah, some trash talk, right? And then yeah. he humorously pulls back. So, like, I was saying APEC are just too dominant in the June Just and they uh, never stood a chance. Why you gotta be the guy who goes, sure you did, like, shit's, shit face smiley. Just don't be the guy. Like, everyone understands the joke, don't explain the joke. Never explain the joke. Like, you ruined the joke. Just don't. Like, I had to it's censor you. But, response. Yes. Yes. It's like, come on, it's the, it's the worst type of comedy. Everyone gets it. Virtually everyone. There's no reason to bring it up. Not, not the three likes of the other idiots that si think the same thing. Uh, are worth it. I, I promise you they aren't. Just stop. Just stop. Just reply bang or tweet and move on, you know? Yeah, that, that's peak comedy. On the <laughs> People have to understand that Hunter also comes from the LA Valiant, the, the old LA Valiant, Packing 10 style of like, just putting some shit talk in there. Yeah, um, sure. It's good. Uh, Packing 10, especially in the day, he'd love to go for d and Glads because that was that rivalry. Yeah, still, he still does. Still does. He still does from the grave. The like... <laughs> <laughs> um, just from the sidelines now um good on him but yeah like this is it should, look players coaches and people part of teams shit talking is a natural part of the the sport and it's a good thing um as long as within you know within good yeah good yeah, natured no. you know intentions and that kind of stuff um and good on unto to pull it back the other way and be like you know they were the better they were better all along and and i had no chance like that's funny to me as well yeah um yeah for but, sure you know any they are definitely fans that get upset about this. this, is, this mm. I think the same fans that would get upset about under saying this, the same fans that got upset about me predicting Shanghai to one. It's just like, guys. Yeah. <laughs> they really hurt you, didn't they? Come on. I think it, uh, it was just, it's just, it's just kind of dumb. It's just like, I think the counter is like at five now where you brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, well, it's just, I don't know. It's just like, it's just like people, there were like people who would like go back and like they made a comment about it and then like like three days later and they go back to the same thing and be like, oh, I'm so correct. It's like what you, you pulled the trigger after the Shanghai lost 0-3 mm -hmm. and you like, you wanted to nail me down like some like 
gotcha, send you to prison now. It's the best found, when found the evidence. It's the best when and your then, prediction then, then comes Alice through, right? And it's like, yeah, you should have, you should have, they should have probably ah, have not pulled the trigger the best, too soon there, mate. Should have waited. Should have waited until the end before you pull the trigger, shouldn't you? Um, so uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's just like the... guys, it's a sport. Chill out. People are gonna, people gonna pre People take preds way too seriously. People uh, always ask me for my preds and they get really fucking angry about it later. It's like, don't ask for my preds then. Don't ask. You, yeah. don't, you don't want to hear it. The, the feeling you get you when really you don't. predicted something that actually comes true and everyone dunked on you is this very same feeling I found out as someone offensively GGing you in StarCraft and you end up winning. <laughs> Ah, oh, that's yeah, the best. They lose the goalpost. They'll, then they make an excuse like, oh, they yeah. lose the goalpost. Like, no, but it's I don't really care. I won. This reason, that reason. Baby, I won. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> Pen on paper. I won that shit. Like, <laughs> nobody's yeah, going to take it away with that probably. I cleaned up 14 points in just the tournament for the pick yeah. There you up. go. Um, but that aside, I think, you know, we, we already talked about New York just slightly here, but I think New York, we're kind of. I kind of had in the show notes is like here for a good time, not a long time. I think, you know, they were pretty happy to just to be here because they pretty much weren't going to make it unless Fusion completely dropped the ball, which they did, yeah. losing that one map to Valiant. And then the entire, like, you know, floodgates open for New York yeah. opportunity to just slide on in happened. Um, and New York made the best of that because they actually beat Hangzhou. So credit to credit to them. Like, it's not like New York got here for free just because Valiant won a map. They also oh, had to course, beat yeah. 4 zero Hangzhou Spark. Um, in a they look good not, too. In, in a matter that is not the loser of Moira. No. Like, um, which means, again, like those teams that are not Shanghai were just not going to be prepared for this. They were just, in hindsight, that's easy for me to say. And, you know, because at the time I was thinking, like, yeah, maybe they could have a chance if they just play what well, they're playing in APAC. But even then, Atlanta kind of can also play that and would have probably have beaten New York in that case. Um, but in hindsight, now when we when we discover that Lucio Moira was the more successful combo game, important mm. that the wording of this is successful. Um, yeah, I mean, it, if if we look at it through that lens, and New York was never going to really stand the chance unless they could be as good as Shanghai and you know work it out in three days, which I don't think any team in APAC could do except Shanghai. Agreed, agreed. It, it's kind of a shame too because um, I thought New York actually looked quite good. Um, against the the spark in particular, um, and and with what Shanghai was showing, it, it in a way I feel a little uh, jilted, maybe uh, you know robbed of this you know, fun Arisa comp. Um, but what are you gonna do? Um, I I don't know if this necessarily signals anything for New York in particular. Um, is this a comeback? Is this maybe some wind in the sails? Some some reassurance to some of the rookies? It's tough to say just because of how quickly they were just kind of like brought in and shipped out. Um, it, it, well, we'll have to see because I I really don't. Is the what I don't know the thing. I mean, yeah, I mean that, and like they also need a couple like of pounds of mental tenacity in this. Like, yeah, it's yeah. like they. Whatever happened, like it, everything is per per perfectly balanced, you know, it's like unbreakable, basically, like whatever Shanghai has in order to get back into the series, NYXL mm. has not on the other side, right? They just like snatched that from them. Um, so veteran yeah. plays, what are you talking about? Because Shanghai is full of veteran plays. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> and New York are not Rookie full team. Of yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, better in team. True. Yeah. Uh, Even though like. Yakpung is a veteran. I mean, yeah. I guess. Yeah, I mean, true, right? Like, like uh, Yakpung, Bianca, and Jonak, of which Yakpung spent another year in contenders, and Bianca was a sub player yeah. last year. It's just like even even the veterans outside of Jonak is just like I think Ivy's the only other guy that had like a lot of playtime. Mm -hmm. You could consider like, yeah, this is like a good. Dude He's been here before. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there's not, yeah. and it's not even that the rookies are the ones underperforming necessarily. Like I don't think no, Flora it's is just playing like a, badly. I don't think Bang Woman is playing. It's badly. an overall just bizarre coordination. I think if anything, the calling structure probably has been flipped around a num number of times. Um, yeah, it's it's tough. They seem to always just find their way back to slow compositions. So maybe that's just where they need to start with. Maybe uh, the new meta is good for them. It's possible, them. or you just make it good for you. Just they need a Widowmaker meta. I think they need a Widowmaker meta. I'm be real. Like sure. what I no, I'm not even just saying that because Guangbong wins the one v one for Widowmaker. Sure. I knew in the preseason when I saw some early footage in New York and seeing Guangbong the Widow, I knew that was going to be good. Yeah. Just yeah. mechanically, mm. this guy was like 
like give him a year and this guy has the potential to be arms level but he needs that development to get there mm, mm. but he has the potential he has like he's got the kind of stock for it you know he's got the kind of the juice you need to get to an arms level yeah he just needs the help to get there for but sure. if he gets that help then you've, you've now got the the best water maker ever he can do that but um uh, no, I wasn't surprised he won the one v one. I know one asked, but yeah, I'll just say anyway, I wasn't surprised <laughs> he won the one v one. Nobody watched either. <laughs> but yeah, I watched clearly. But, uh, I, you know, I would have loved selfishly. I would have loved it if DM DM stayed on just a little bit longer to yeah. try to get his side on the one v one. Oh yeah, just a little bit. Hmm. Yeah, That's magical. And then, he, and then maybe he retires as a three time back to back to back three p one v one winner. Yeah, no, maybe different world yeah it's just it, i don't know like i think what nyxl has demonstrated throughout this tournament cycle is that they have the potential there's very clearly something there right yeah of course in the fabric of this team it's just like they they gotta get the spaghetti dropping out of their system like and as soon as that happens i think you might even have a sick, second powerhouse team in uh, in apac i mean maybe uh, even a third with spark coming in as well but um yeah. Until then. And four, and then There's got to be a big uh, shift for this team. Were you about to say Soul? He was about to say Soul, guys. Yeah, of course he's oh going to say Soul because he's an intelligent man. Oh my God. Let's actually, I think that's uh, any further comments about NYXL we'll include into the next segment now as we look at the, the updated right. league standings in terms of where everyone's at now. Um, and we can, you know, address where all of our teams that played in the finals have actually gotten towards. So, um, well, let me get it on my screen as well. Obviously, Shanghai and Dallas, right at the top. I mean, yeah. the amount of extra points you get for going to a tournament is insane. Did NYX all get any points from that? By the way, you have no. to win, right? No. So that, you, you have to, to win a game. They were the only okay, ones so that didn't. Third. Sadly. Um, they were there, but they couldn't quite get anything. Atlanta... Uh, we'll get some free points off that as well. Not free points, they had to work for that. But Shanghai are on 11 points. The next team is Seoul on 6. Like, damn, that's a difference. Almost double. Dallas is on 10. San Francisco is on 7. Less of a difference, but still somewhat significant. Yeah. It's getting pretty clear when it comes to some of these seeds that, you know, certain teams are just already in. Like, you've got to royally yeah. screw the pooch yes. before you, you kind of get uh, shipped out. There are some teams that still feel kind of borderline, but we'll get into them, you know, as we get a little bit closer to summer shutdown. But uh, yeah, Dallas Fuel, Shanghai Dragons feel like a lock. Um, inversely, there are some teams that uh, very clearly are probably not up to scratch and will probably not be making it. Surprise, surprise. Um, but I, I guess in this way, maybe a, an interesting question. Uh, for the both of you um is this a two horse race do you see anybody kind of like cutting in it edgewise um in these next couple months mm. you time to think it? anybody kind of ring you know I'll, I'll again you first i uh, okay the thing is yeah sorry keep going <laughs> go no you you i said you want some, yeah i'll give okay. you time there you go um <laughs> i'm over real I think Shock can. I think that's the, sure. the one team that I'm, I'm sort of interested in in making it there. I think the other ones have once again revealed like a problem of inconsistency and maybe mm. a little bit of a green factor. Um, I think the Shock are the ones where you go like, okay, like if they once not hit the side of the bracket that Dallas is on. Um, yeah then I think there's a really real chance that they will make next, next tournament and um, they will have a, a higher projected chance than Atlanta for me, just based on the character of this team to make it deeper. Now, I yeah. also am cognizant of me having still the idea that this is the old shock. In many ways, it doesn't feel like the old shock, right? Like, it feels like a destabilization of that that attribute that they had has taken place with these new players and also possibly like part of the coaching staff leaving. So I don't know. I, I don't know if, if my mind or my gut thinks this because this is narrative analysis. I just don't trust any other team to get there no. to that degree. I think for I'll instance, 
Like, if you get a really good meta, I think Justice can peak high and can probably get into a final. Um, sure. But other than that, I don't see it. And I don't see it from APEC either, unless Fusion, like, gets their team together and has some miraculous catch-up. Uh, that's the other... But I, everyone else? It's not likely. My... You don't see it. Go ahead, go ahead, everyone. Question is, when does that happen for Shock? Because they haven't mm. made a tournament yet. They've not qualified for a single tournament yep. So yep. when does that happen? Does that happen in Summer Showdown when they qualify? Does that happen in Countdown Cup? Or are we just talking they don't make a single tournament, but they just get enough points to get into the play-ins? Just for clarity's sake, the way the playoff structure works this year is top two teams from East and West will go into the playoffs, and then there's a number of other... How many other teams? There's a bunch of other teams that will get into the play-ins instead. Um, and if Shark don't make a single tournament, they're probably a play-ins team. They're probably a favorite in the play-ins, but they're not going to be a playoffs sure. team straight off the bat. So if I think like, top when three is if Shark are going to do it, when are they going to when are they going to click? Is it by next tournament or the tournament after that, or not at all? Yeah, I think top three for uh, NA and top two for APAC directly qualify. And then, so Shark theoretically is currently top three yeah. directly in. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So that's do you a need possible. To see them do you need to see them go into a tournament next to the fuel? Or are you just saying, like, to me, yeah. because of the discussion, is, is it a two-horse race or is it more? And if mm. it's got to be more than that, and a shock it can have a capability of, you know, going deep and winning a tournament, and then, you know, do the shock need to win a tournament? Do they need to, and this kind of goes back to last week's conversation about the shock era, right? Do they need to, you know, go and what do they need to do here? Like, yeah. I don't see shock being a team that just slides by off only regular season standings in 16 games to get into the play-ins and go from there. I think they need to do well in at least one tournament, surely. Yes, for sure. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And I it, don't think it feels can... like it kind of until then. It, it, it is kind of a two-horse race. Like, is the spark consistent enough to be considered, a, you know, a, a, a king slayer? Not really. It's just Dallas and Shanghai consistently are putting up both, you know, uh, adaptation and consistent results. Um, and it's not surprising that they're, you know, the two finalists in both our tournaments thus far um, after, you know, like oh. I mentioned, you know, struggling kind of earlier on. Mm. I think Fusion could do it. I think Fusion to me have a, have a decent chance of mm -hmm. adding the adding to the race. Um, if they're slowly assembling their pieces, you know, yeah, they're getting they're getting all their infinity stones together slowly, bit yeah. by bit. They got EQO in and now funny Astro's in and they're just waiting for the rest to arrive. Um, and then the question will be like. Is that enough to beat the Avengers of Shanghai or Dallas? You know, is it is it enough? Um, Infinity War would say yes. I've got to stop with the Avengers <laughs> references now. But um, Philadelphia Fusion, I think, like when I've seen them at their peak, I'm like, damn, this team is good. And this may be a little bit mm. of discussion about honeymoon period. Is that over now and all that kind of stuff as well? Um, Maybe it's only but, continuing because they keep dripping, you know, new players in. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> They're spicing hmm. up the marriage. I understand. You know, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Period going. You just uh, open things up. <laughs> just introducing new people into that relationship all the time. Uh, they've, <laughs> they've just added funny Astro. So, yeah, uh, this team looks flexible. They got high highs in there, like a lot of great players. Um, but they have been known to kind of choke in important games and playoffs and come second a lot as well. So, you know, we'll see. I don't know if they'll be as favorite as what Shanghai is showing. You also could have, by the way, a sort of situation like last year, 2020, where Shanghai are like hard favorites from APEC and then Soldiers beat them in the finals and then go oh, to the finals instead. 100%. I think it's it's almost likely at this point that we see like a peak team come playoff patch. We know it's coming. We know it's going to be goofy. We're coming off a hero pool going into playoffs. So we're going to get another Justice. We're going to get another who oh. London Spitfire, maybe, maybe not a, a champion in that way, but somebody's going to make a run. Somebody's going to make a stab at it. Who that is, you always have to give Soul a shout as much as Avril's the warlock, but you know, of what I'm <laughs> saying that Yiska, Yiska has, has you pinned as like the, the soul like channeler of like evil where you yeah. just always seem to want to pred soul or Can like, I be honest? yeah, yeah. I, my, so Achilles and I actually, we had Preds, we'd said this live on broadcast as part of the sure. Pringles segment of like, we had to make a bold prediction. I do remember, and do remember. I, and I said, Shanghai, we're going to go to the finals and win. And he said that Seoul, we're going to go he to the finals Seoul, and win. Yeah. So I actually didn't go for Seoul. He went for Seoul. I went for Shanghai. You got him <laughs> as, as well. As, you got him. As much as I'm <laughs> yeah. the Seoul Warlock, you know. 
<laughs> not this time, apparently. Not not that tournament cycle. Where did you have them uh, in I your power you... rankings preseason again? To Seoul. Yeah. That's preseason. Yeah. <laughs> Don't act like you're, yes, you're better than those people. Don't act like those fans. <laughs> I still want to say you're not done better. He's no, no, I'm just means, like, means my prediction for the whole tournament. No, 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 no. I'm not saying for the, for the whole tournament. Right. I'm saying specifically at, at the start. Do you remember? I don't have them. Uh, I, I, I think it was high, top kind of, five or something. Uh, they were very high. Let me try and find them. I'm going to go through my tweets. I actually forgot. I've t- completely forgot. I mean, it's been they're so high, long. High. Yeah. I had them very high. Yeah, no, but um, uh, I, I don't know. Like, sold. Yes, they can peak in the meta. I don't think like already they're yep. like that. It's it's ironic. It's like they can't co- like concentrate on two things at once. Almost like lazy students. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Arnold, um, but they are now doing pretty well in the regular season. But they are not doing well in the yep. tournaments. What gives? Like I think, I think this one yeah. hurt them a lot. Oh, this I one shifted. Second, by the way, second place preseason. Oof. <laughs> That's a right there. I don't even care if it's just preseason power rankings. Like, <laughs> wait, is this just for APEC? <laughs> yeah, for second. Oh, uh, for APEC. APEC. No, yeah, okay. The whole league. Are no. you kidding me? Okay. Yeah. It's not all good then. All good then. I mean, did, did share your uh, your affinity for glides though. Funnily enough. Yeah, because preseason scrim bucks were, were high. <laughs> they were. I, I heard some good stuff. Yeah. But... Wow. Sparks so low, but uh, I guess I guess it's not. I mean, really unwarranted. Yeah. Yeah. Really. Preseason. Yeah. No. Regardless. Um, regardless. Just to bring them up on on screen, this, these were Avril's preseason power rankings. Some decade at the end of the season now, like it's September, someone's going to come back and be like, oh, you thought Gladiators were going to win? I'm oh. like, dude, this is not my prediction for the season, you dickhead. That, that dickhead's on mine. this show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's... <laughs> that's this kid's burner account. Yeah, no, that that's that stuff sailed now. Like, the the tournament points are so, too strong. Like, Glads are not yeah. catching up on Dallas again. But I also completely but botched Dallas. Dallas in first? Yeah, really. I had that Dallas in... Dallas in ninth or something. Like, it was, it was, it was really so, bad. Someone was like, oh, you put Dallas in seventh? Yeah, because they just lost Exy and they don't have a fucking trace of yeah. yeah. Trace of meta. That's yeah. why I had them seventh. Yeah. Preseason rankings. Doesn't Pretty mean much. That's what they're going to finish in. Pretty much. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Which brings. Do you guys uh, actually think Dallas will improve with Pine? I, f- I feel like Pine could be a bit of a trap. I think it will. I, yes I think completely the opposite. I think he's weirdly. Like the one of the best stylistic fits. If he continued, like if you remember him on NYXL, like he was very much out of sorts for their tempo, where they were kind of like very passive, not superhero play centric. If anything, it was just funnel resources into Jonak and let him kind of rock. Pine can keep up with this Dallas Fuel team. If they continue to play like all these high temp- tempo stuff, like you can see him just She's roll not. around as McCree and just do all kinds of crazy She's shit. They... I, I think it's a weirdly specific in season one. Huh? It, it's it's a in season one. <laughs> yeah, in season one. Again, like it is predicated on the fact that he continued to be that player I mean, in the future. Yeah, it's like which, your again, argument makes complete sense to, to a person that has been in curostasis for the last three years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, well, sure. Here's <laughs> we'll have to wait and see. see. Is that what you want? We'll we'll just have to see. Nobody knows what's there to say. We haven't seen him yet. Is he ever gonna play? Nope. Hi, Who's to say? Ah, like, sure, yeah. The the thing is, like, Pine feels exactly like the type of player that could tank this team theoretically from this get up because <laughs> you have like. <laughs> I mean, I'm not diplomatic with this. <laughs> no, but my point is, <laughs> do you want to swallow first? <laughs> Be very careful where you go next from a person who's done it. Don't, you know, just, just no, lay it like, out there, but I don't know. My, my point is, you have a player that's a big yeah. personality, right? Mm-hmm. So you have an incentive to play him more. You have a player that's pretty sensitive, so you want to give him confidence. And if your team doesn't immediately win, especially when you were sure. are one of the two best teams... And that's not exactly a confidence boost. No, of course not. And it's it's the only option on hits can you have, unless you want to do that mumbo jumbo like wiggly waggly <laughs> for the second half of the season as well. Like 
the work uh, for the first half. I don't know. Maybe they don't need it. Lock on legs. Sure. That's their answer. Work then. Yeah, I don't know. Like play faster. It uh, works until you enter like a very heavy, like, you know, you must play yes. Ash, you must play Widow, or you are straight up inting. And at that stage, and I'm not talking about like you can still argue like, oh, but you know, Russian A, they still they'll just invent the meta, you know, go back to the, the GG Recon interview you did with Aid where he's like, No, we'll just invent the meta, whatever we will play will be meta. Like that yeah. that works to a degree until you get into a meta that's so yeah, hypothetically, so heavily involved that like if you don't have a top level wood on your team, you're gonna get owned. Like that that meta mm. could exist. We yep. don't know what the patches and in the hero pools in the future could look like. Yep. And at that stage, if you don't have Pine or someone that can compete, you're done. Yep. I mean, but the problem is what is if you get a meta where Tracer is just like the ace? What are you doing? I just lose Sparkle has to get much better on Tracer. Sparkle yeah, no. Yeah. And Sparkle he hasn't won't. Looked that bad. That bad is not like you're winning against. No, it's like, not the w no. You're right. And, and it is not the like weapon you need, but I don't think it's enough to say it's a detriment. I think there are plenty of teams. He's serviceable. Sparkle yes. will always be serviceable be on Tracer, fine. but he will never be. He's not going to be striker on your team, but he will be serviceable. Yeah, but what if yeah, you're? I don't, I don't think it's a hole. What if you are in a in a grand final situation against striker? Sure. And if oh, Tracer is gonna, the, he's then, gonna fuck you hard. <laughs> yeah, 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 I mean, yeah. who's the, <laughs> How many players can can hold up to that world class caliber? You 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 hope that. I Jackson mean, you can try. Good. You can do better <laughs> than a widow one trick that played four maps in season one. Surely. <sighs> I mean, sure. If you want to <laughs> criticize the pine signing, go for it. I, I mean, you're not going to hear from me. All I'm gonna say is Shanghai are ready because they got lips tracer which looked phenomenal. Yeah, and then lips lips hit scan which is phenomenal. They're ready to mm -hmm. go. This is why I'm saying lip is like to me the best hit scan because he's mm -hmm. just he's just playing everything. He's just so yeah, well yeah, rounded. Yeah. Yeah. Just phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. Um, agreed. So, Where was this kid last year? Playing sombra, he was hard. I know the whole time and he, irritating. And look, I think he his sombra was also good, but we didn't know that him playing sombra was equivalent to him like strapping sandbags to his legs yeah. and arms and playing like handicap the whole time. I didn't realize how much better everything else he played was going to be. Um, speaking of players and awards, shall we head towards our, uh, you know, this is what this last thing of the show, our mid season awards for just MVP. This is just for the tournament cycle. So we'll pick within the four teams, uh, just most improved, which I uh, will open up for the entire league, all 20 teams. Uh, season MVP front runner, basically who we think is currently the most, you know, the person that either deserves MVP the most for the entire season or is, you know, front running for that award and similar for Rookie of the Year. So we'll start with uh, June Just MVP first, who would like to start us off. I'll go first, and I'll say Fate. Oh, I yeah. thought. The answer. Ooh, there yeah, you go. For okay. me, I think I think he was the when when I look at most most valuable. Um, there, there was a specific player that was so key to a strategy or so, you know, impactful in their performance that, you know, uh, you can you can kind of rest your opinion on and say if they didn't have this player, then they would have not have won. And I think um, I don't think anybody else could have done Fate's job there. Um, and in that way, I, I do have to give kind of a sub credit to Moon to kind of figure that out. But um, with how how many different styles um how many different looks that he in particular alone threw at the dallas fuel to kind of beat them at their game um yeah felt like a an, an easy mvp for me um, an easy we are MVP. there's nothing easy about this like i'm struggling Wait. do you have a clear answer avril Ah, uh, yeah, I lean heavily towards fate as well. I don't know if I just want to copy Joe really? here or do mm. yeah. or somewhere else. Because just to div to make sure I'm I'm understanding this, you're talking the entire tournament cycle, right? Like first four games and then the knockouts, or just the knockouts. I think this one is just the. Uh, do we want to open up to the entire tournament cycle? Is that, would that be better? Hey, go for it. Yeah, if do if you that. have a better answer, go for it. I right, just do the entire tournament cycle. We, it's called June Jow, so whatever. Do the entire right. tournament yeah. cycle. Who's your MVP that didn't make top four? Uh, no. I have a different MVP. I, okay. I go fearless. Fair enough. I think over the 
That's why I asked. I think in the qualifying matches, sure. like it was um, like a pretty important um, player that also stood out just like so incredibly, right? Like, um, mm. I think over the breadth of the amount of games they had to play, he was also not a slouch in the final itself. Um, I think his Winston, it, it's just different, you know? It's the exact difference where, you know, like, in games, you can have a very clear distinction when someone is special. And that's when you okay. listen to the comms of their opponents. If someone mm. says, Tracer is on me, that's a different communication than, I don't know, Sebiolbi is Striker. on me. Or Striker sure. is on me. That's a different, that's a 30% damage buff that you're communicating to your uh, team now. It's the psychic damage. And you, you, you kind of have to now adjust to, uh, to that situation. And in many ways, yeah. this feels like Fearless has been on, uh, on people, and it's a different type of Winston. And I don't think, in terms of Winston, anyone has come close. Almost heaving it uh, into meta consideration. Like, I'm not sure if we're thinking that much even about that comp if Dallas doesn't consistently prove that this works with, uh, with a Winston um, and uh, these dive uh, tanks, right? So mm. I think there's a very real world where, just like by the, the sociology of meta, that teams like, like the Dragons um, just dominate the meta situation so much with Orisa that we just play that all the time. And yep. by the power of Fearless combined, we somehow didn't make that a thing. And it's a thing that other teams recognize. I, I rem remember, like, Kai specifically pointing that out to me in, in the tournament, saying, like, mm, Dallas are the team that define the meta, usually. So they're the, mm -hmm. the top dogs, the honcho, uh, big, big guys. But, like, <sighs> they need some time to get rolling, which is fair. Like, that's just a, a pattern you got to recognize in their, in their way to championships, right? You got to give them some. As we gave some to shock every once in a while, oh, like they're yep. they're the shock sometimes had like downswings in performance. That's not the flavor that the Del Fuel have. They have a downswing towards the start of a meta, which is like one match day, and then they come back, right? Mm. Um, as at least as far as we know. So I feel pretty good about Fearless here. Um, uh, Joe, do you want to? Do you, you happy with fate, or do you want to change anything based on the new category? I know, like we kind of, we kind of oh. jumped that on you. Now that we're talking about the entire tournament cycle, you still happy with fate? Oh yeah, I, I think um, I, I appreciate the fearless point just because it did kind of set up the meta and and forced you know Shanghai to answer it. But uh, yeah, in the final, I think in the most impactful match with the the narrative and and how he performed, yeah, I'll stay with mm -hmm. fate. I'm gonna go for someone different. Um, just because I don't know, I guess I just like to be different. I'm just gonna sure. uh, here we do go. the the contrary. The reinforced answer. spicy take. We um, we know that one. Um, it's gonna be from someone from Soul, obviously, because I'm the warlock. Oh no! <laughs> I'm, I'm, just, I'm just joking. <laughs> um, I I already talked the guy up. I've already been simping hard, so I might as well just say okay. lip. And the reason for that is because a it's a player that you guys haven't talked about yet, and in, in terms of who you picked, but it's mm -hmm. also um the fact that you know, this guy has had to be so flexible over the course of this tournament cycle and previous ones as well. Like, I I can talk about his tracer, but that's not relevant to Jun Joust, even though it's in the back of my mind. But here, Lip has had to play like an insanely good McCree, Ash, Watermaker, um, and then for this actual tournament period, the Reaper as well, which he actually got kind of diffed on by Doha to start with. And then he ended things by getting that 3K. And, you know, there's all the factors in terms of how he got that, but Lip really started to come into this Reaper role that he didn't even play for like the entire cycle for the entire mm. stage um and the entire team had to get around how it was going to be effective and i i was close to giving this to doha and i was thinking the whole time like while you guys are talking if i actually if i went before yeska here i would have maybe said doha just because i think like his impact on the reaper was so damn high mm -hmm. when yep. i was watching their games over again the guy gets into your back line so easily he's it's hard to check him it's hard to mark him his impact is mega, mega high. He's always on the right players. He's, you know, getting these death blossoms in exactly right areas. He's timing things well. He's reading voids matrix as well. All of these things on the matrix, uh, on on his Reaper play that was just so high level that was doing a lot. And I didn't think Reaper was going to be one of the defining heroes of this meta. I was looking at, you know, it could be a Winston, it could be you know Fearless on the Winston again. It could be you know Echo's a defining hero in this meta. And I was kind of 
you know, not really looking at the Reaper, but the more I kind of looked at Doha, I was like, maybe it could be the Reaper. And so for for me, uh, I, I went towards Lip just because if we're opening up to the entire tournament cycle and I look at everything that's been played, I'm like, Lip's stats have been insane. Every game I've casted of him that I watched of him, always at the top, insanely consistent. I think he's, I'll say it one more time, I think he's the best hit scan currently in the league. Definitely in APAC. Maybe it's a little bit more arguable in, in the NA side of things. Uh, so yeah, Lip to me has just been so phenomenal. And then he picks up the Reaper and mm. he gets a little bit diff by Doha, but then he catches up and, you know, is a part of that Shanghai one at the end. I think it's, it ends up being a pretty clear choice for me. Fair play. Good choice. All right. Most improved. I'm not going to lie. I, I got to ask some parameters here because does it mean sure. most improved from May Melee or from season start, from perception of season start? <laughs> What's the comparison? Watch's win? release. Uh, <laughs> 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 From the first I, moment they touched, I watched the game. Sure. As much as it's a non-answer, I'd probably lean on however you want to frame it. Okay. If it's from May, if it's from the season, if it's from this one in particular, Let's whoever say, stuck out. How's it written in this thing? June Joust most improved. Uh, I guess it's got to be from. I think it'd be more interesting if we said it from the whole season, but it's written okay. the way it's written is, is kind of for the cycle. But maybe mm. it'd be better if it was for the whole season because mm -hmm. then you got more to work with. Mm -hmm. Okay, we fixed so, that. Nobody saw anything. Fixed. Most improved so, so far. So whole season then, like most improved. Just most, just generally speaking, most improved. Yeah. Uh, so oh. now it's, it, could, oh, it could just be anybody. Yeah. It could just yeah. be yeah. anybody. You want me to rattle a name and see if sure. it meets the criteria or maybe it you know, points sure. in the right direction. I'm or gives you an idea, rather. Maybe. Um, <laughs> for somebody to come in with such high expectation, um, kind of under-deliver, but also start to lead his team coming into the play-ins for the June Joust, I thought that Valentine had a, you know, good showing. I think that he's kind of coming into himself as Boston is as well. I was very close to kind of having a cop out saying, well, the whole Boston uprising was the most improved, you know, uh, entity uh, coming into June joust. But I think Valentine in particular is kind of stepping into his ace role um, as Boston's finding their sea legs and is, is starting to be, you know, this Pelican esque figure that you know, is going to become a threat coming into, you know, the last two tournaments being the summer shutdown or the countdown cup. Um, and yeah, I'd say that uh, over the course of, the season thus far, I think he's improved quite a deal. Such a curse pick, even the graphic is cursing it. <laughs> it is what it is. Can I say I'm a cursed person? So what what you're describing as improvement is like from season start how Valentine played to now, or from contenders it, to now? I'd say from season start. Yeah. From, from the season, Overwatch League, Overwatch League, League right. in particular. Don't include contenders, otherwise it's going to get messy. Yeah. Right. Very messy. Do you have one, ever? I'm still thinking. I'm, it's I'm tough. So it's tough. It's actually really hard on because it, it's like because I'm thinking like oh this player but then it's like no but he was actually kind of good at the start of the season so maybe not. Um, because man. I'm thinking if I'm thinking from last season to this I, season, I actually do have one. I actually do have one. Do There's, you want me to go? Or do you want to go? You go. I'm gonna say Fitz. Ooh, so okay. there he goes. The warlock okay. has gone for soul again. Oh, there we go. You got me. Uh, right into his narrative, his trap. Had to go back to Seoul. Um, no, I think Fitz was kind of average at the start, and Fitz started picking up when Fitz, Fitz to me really turned the ship around when he started getting a lot more comfortable on these hit scans. I think there was this Ash game, there was this Ash mm -hmm. game which he just dominated on, and I was just like, Where did Fitz come from? Like, I had no idea he was just going to do this, you know. And I was at that point, I was even thinking, Oh, well, the Fitz versus Lip narrative could be a strong one because you know, these two really good hit scans coming through APAC now. Um, and then, well, I mean, Lip and Shanghai dominated, and Seoul kind of fell apart, but. Uh, to me, still, in t if we're talking about improvement over the over the tournaments or over the, over the entire season, a play that kind of started soft and didn't really have this kind of massive fuck you kind of energy um, it has to be fits because he can't, he kind of started soft and then towards the end, you know, the end of June Joust, even though Seoul still buckled and they played the wrong comps versus Shanghai, didn't make in the tournament and they got close. Uh, yeah, dude, Fitz was so good towards the end, like his his development from the start of the season to now is like making. Before, I think you look at Soul and Fitz is like part of the team, but it's it's more of like a profit led DPS line. Mm -hmm. Now it's like a prof Fitz. You know, this is the whole prof Fitz duo now that has evolved into into what we have in the modern day. Hmm. I'm still not sure if my my pig would stretch the 
definition because my pick in my mind like it's a i can't believe i'm thinking of this name and oh god i, I won't we'll never hear the end of it but mine it's is like especially what? in comparison to last season where this player was and where he is now <laughs> Where he's a legitimate MVP candidate. And it's Leaf. Yeah. Like, Leaf it's, is. It's pretty clear. Like, it doesn't make sense that this kid is legitimately. Like, I think he's never played better Overwatch in comparison to the uh, Elite yeah. than he has now. Like, he was he's nuts. He, he, like, somehow this guy made it to speak this season. It just doesn't make sense that it's possible. He's super young still, right? Like, we forget that he was already, like, cracked at 16, right? He's only 19. <laughs> He's only 19 now, right? Like, but the, the, import, like the improvement and what he is able to just do, I don't know if anyone holds these peaks at the moment that he has. It's actually, it's, I have so much incentive to not say this, but at the same time, yeah, like you gotta you gotta give credit where credit is due, right? Like it's, um, mm -hmm. yeah. I think Leaf is is. I feel good about I that. Pick. You broke the rules. Sorry, I agree with you. But I think you, but I'm gonna just say you broke the rules because you're you're comparing him to last right. year as well. And if right. we do that, I would also pick Leaf. Right. Okay. So the reason I didn't pick I was... Leaf, I thought about Leaf as well. The reason I didn't pick him is because I felt like he started the season pretty strong. Okay, yeah. but that's just yeah. me. Right, I was very close for very similar reasons to pick leave as well. If we do in season, I kind of talked about it last last week. I think I'm so 37 is someone I would throw in. Okay, just because the floor, even where he performed at the start of the season and now, it's also something that's recognized by very teams. different. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Yeah. Yep, yep. And by the way, Joe did an article on leave. So there you go. Did I did got to speak with him ahead of ahead of June. And uh, picked his brain a little bit. It's pretty Anything cool. Nice in there. Yeah, we could give us a little large. bit of a teaser. Um, folks into the article. Very again, just kind of uh, reiterating a lot of confidence in his team and and the coaching staff and their, said, their... Hey, do you, hey, leave. Do you think you're the best echo in the world? That's the question you should ask. If you could do it again, maybe maybe, maybe there is a follow up in in the works, and Ooh. perhaps we'll we'll get to the uh, the echo topic. Hopefully, okay. hmm. season MVP front runner. Guys, um, see, mine already got a bunch of love, so it feels very easy to argue. But I don't know if I, you guys have strong opinions. I mean, it's profit, right? Can we all agree? <laughs> uh, of course, yeah. <laughs> all my answers are beat. Stop. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I'm going to be boring. I, I think it's still got to be fearless. It's got to be someone yeah, on a team that's won. I think so. The reason, yeah, I agree. I'd pick someone like Lee with the problem is Chengdu hasn't, hasn't won. They haven't mm -hmm. got to that level. And I, you got to pick someone from like an also winning team who's had a phenomenal year. And it's the easiest answer has to be fearless. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Oh, okay. Can we all be boring not and not pick fearless? All three. All three oh. fearless. Is that what's going on? No, I, I definitely did not pick fearless. I, I agree for a lot of the parameters, but I did not pick fearless. Okay. You want to go next then? Sure. Um, I have Doha. Here's why. I think he, at the moment, for my money, is playing not the mechanical best Overwatch, but the he's he's providing the tool sets and the attributes that I particularly think are incredibly important for a, a star Overwatch League player to have. He has these presence of mind moments to make these, you know, calls on the fly to, to swap Hanzo and stuff going back to the main melee. Um, to Avril's point earlier, being incredibly consistent and finding ways in where you really shouldn't be able to do and finding these consistent, you know, when you look at the Reaper, um, finding these consistent death blossoms, these consistent assassinations. Um, he not only that, but he has a fantastic hero pool, can play a whole lot of different things, compliments, you know, his team very well. Um, and, and for my money, yeah, I'd say that he is there's not too many players in the world that would be able to fill his shoes as successfully. Um, you look at somebody like Fleta, you look at somebody, again, like Prophet, um, they're, they're kind of becoming a similar class. And I think Doha, this, this is his entry into that you know, elite few, that elite club of colorless players that can do, you know, be, be malleable and kind of fit wherever need be. I think, you know, sad to see Libero go 
I still don't know what's going on with that kid, by the way. Um, but I, I would Rich move man. Doha into that class, Crypto. hopefully. Crypto King Libero, dude. Crypto. I will say the only thing about Doha for me is like, I agree with your points, generally speaking. Um, mm -hmm. and he, the, when, you, when you mentioned he fulfills a very important role in the team, that role is in some ways, the best way I can describe it is kind of shadowing Sparkle, which sure. I know sounds bad because it sounds like um, it's like, oh, well, Sparkle's the, the he's the star player and Doha's his understudy or some shit. Or like, it sounds like, mm -hmm. it sounds like Doha's a Robin and, and here's Sparkle the Batman, right? It's kind of what it sounds like, but in a way, mm -hmm. the way they complement each other is despite them having like a shitload of overlap in the hair pulls, let's be honest, pretty sure. much everything Sparkle plays, Doha also plays, except the Tracer, funny enough. That's one here yeah. that, Sparkle, that uh, Doha doesn't do. Um, but when you need when you need the Doomfist to come through, or when Sparkle believes it's time for Doomfist, then Doha jumps on the Echo, and you still have yep. it's not even a serviceable Echo. This is like a guy that could be starting on Echo on any other team, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the real power of Doha. Where like when I say he can shadow Sparkle, and look, maybe maybe Dallas Field and, and Rush have all the way they've played it. This is speculation for me. I'm not going to try and put words on Rush's mouth or Dallas's mouth, but the way they play Sparkle, it has looked like Sparkle's more like the lead in terms of. Of course. He's the defining guy on like what's the important hero here? Or oh, Echo or Spark was gonna play it. And the Doha's gonna play the the more supporting role. And that's been, you know, the same when we looked at Doom and Sombra. Why is mm. you know, why why is Spark on the Doom? Because he's the better Doom, probably, but he's kind of like the lead. So in a way, it kind of is like a Batman Robin kind of thing, but maybe that's not giving enough. It's knowing when to be Robin. Doha. Uh you know, there's I think there's a bit of Nighthawk in there. We know we're gonna deeper yes. references rather than just the Robin, but um, you couldn't do what Dallas can do with the hero pulls where, where Sparkle can play this thing and then Doha matches because most teams don't have that second player that has a mm. similar enough hero pull to then fill in the gap. Yep. I think I think to, to kind of play with the analogy, I think it's knowing when to be the shadow and when to kind of step up and be that ace. Um, we've seen Doha on the Echo, on the Sombra, on his own Doomfist, in particular going all the way back to last season, yep. um, be the, the star that they need him to be and he knows when to you know dial it back he knows when to amp it up across all those other points yeah i think he's he's an underrated and often overlooked you know uh integral priest to uh dallas fuel success so for my money um i think uh i'd like to see a doha skin uh, i know that's not coming but uh i'd like to see it a doha nice. sombra skin which you can't see because it's permanently invisible that's why you that's why yeah you know, see you there you go skin. big brain yes because just put fearless in so is yeah. there much explaining required here? Or? No, I, I think like Fearless is. I mean, if I have him as my June Joss MVP, I think that he didn't play any worse That's during fair. the May Melia yeah. run. Just makes sense. It's also really tough because it, it will also feel really tough because it's just like less of a sample size. Um, to really like get a get an impression of someone performing consistently. That's mm -hmm. why like my. I mean, if you source your mind how you decide those, at least for season MVP, it feels like giving it to anyone else outside of Shanghai or uh, Dallas, Dallas probably. Yeah. I mean, you feels cooked right now. Yeah, I I think legitimately there's no like if there if there was a you know like a power level counter truth machine imported from sure. like Vegeta or whatever, like the the it would show that all of these i mean we have something like that in ibm right no it's it's not I guess. perfect but like yeah they would show that uh, the those players are certainly among the best would rank them the highest and it's yeah i i don't know anything else doesn't feel that good i will say the next one i think that's interesting that's an interesting debate and there it is it is it yes, not? I've got some. Uh, I wonder. I mean, I, I have my mind made. I'm I'm going to write mine down, and then I'm not going to change based on what you guys say. Let's see. Sure. Um. Okay. You guys want to go? Yeah. Rookie of the year. Next one, I guess. Front runner for rookie of the year. Um. Oh. I'm thinking Joe is probably on the same page here with me. I'm thinking, probably. but I what I'm what I'm going for is someone that's been really like transformative for their team but also just pounding in their rookie season is looking someone that could actually like if he wasn't a rookie you know you could argue is like mvp caliber um in some cases like that really is and, and plenty of times rookie of the year awards is just basically like they could have just been an mvp yeah anyway. um i mean season one doesn't count because they're all rookies technically but 
right now, the, the player that really just stands out, and maybe this is the easy choice, but Shai is just right there just because of how impactful he's been for the Spark, how massive. Like, if there was a team that you could say most improved team of the season, I think all three of us would have to go to oh, Spark. Yeah. There's just no way. Like, Spark started so poorly and to then go so big, even though they failed to make it through to the extra tournament, which is something They're I think good, is incredible. Um, yeah, and Shai has just been so transformative for this team. Like, as a rookie, I don't, I haven't seen another play on another team. You could argue Pelican, you could argue Gaga, but I think in terms of pure impact on the team and, you know, where this guy is in, in terms of what I can tell on the individual skill level as well, it's just so insanely high. Shy is just an easy pick. Let me support that with some, uh, some stats that I pulled. Um, I, 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 this... Let me support that by also picking Shy. Like, <laughs> well, yes, I, I also have Shy. Shy is my pick. Um, <laughs> but I did, I did do a little bit of the footwork and and looking at some of his heroes that he's played. He's only played three uh, worth of note. But um, you know, looking at some of these stats and they're they're actually quite poignant. Um, overall, for Echo, I think he's relatively above average. Nothing worth of note. I think he was in like the top ten of like uh, eliminations or something. Um, but it really starts to get interesting when you when you get into like the Ash statistics, right? He's first in final blows per ten minutes, first in eliminations, fifth in hero hero damage done, and second in solo kills. If you take the uh, default tick timer on the website down from uh, sixty minutes minimum time played, and you move it down to forty nine. His McCree kind of pops up and he's first in hero damage done with 12,248 damage per 10 minutes, which pales in comparison to the second place player who, funnily enough, is Fitz with 10,732. So he leads almost by a a 2,000 damage per 10 minute difference, right? Which comes into the final point. um, Across all heroes, Shy leads the league in damage done per 10 minutes, um, which I find to be kind of all heroes. All heroes. Mm-hmm. Every single it's not by much. It's very close. But for somebody to put up stats like that, be as impactful like Avril's saying, and also double on top of that, show that he can actually play projectile to a extremely consistent and and you know serviceable degree. I don't think he's the best echo in the world by any stretch of the imagination, but you don't really need to be if you can kind of do the 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 he, wide he variety, put, right? He like he's insane. On the repo. Yeah, Arctic in the, I thought Arctic was going to be the the echo play on this team. Yeah, when you have a team that says, you know what, Shy is a bit of echo versus Arctic. That's crazy. That's how. That's good insane. Is. Yeah, at a rookie, we've been waiting for this kid to show up, and this is the kind of performance you get. That's award winning. That's every, the every problem time I've though. Shy, by the way, and I look at stats. He's never been. He's never below ten thousand per ten damage wise. Yep. By okay. the way. It's the problem, though, with his candidacy. It's like, yes, it's not his fault, and yes, it's some coach had assery, but he didn't actually play most of the season. Or he played like half, right? <laughs> sure, thus far. He didn't play like half of May Malia, but since then, he's never not played. He's played the entire time. Right, yeah. Right. He's, yeah. he's played more than God's been now mm-hmm. at this stage. For sure. Yeah, I mean... So who do you have? I mean... Wait, let me make the camera big so you can see. Yeah, you gotta. Uh, what is that? Oh, Pelican. The bird. Okay. The okay. Bird. So not, not a bad pick. Oh, man, you bad. you talked about um, shy not being the best um, the best uh, echo in the world. Well, Pelican is. Um, Fair. Like this kit in in terms of trend. Uh, transcendentalness of impact on his team. I also believe that's true um, for him. Mm-hmm. It's a completely different character than uh, Ersta could have ever been. At legitimately hard carrying at times on Echo. Like, uh, Agreed. Agreed. Kill, kills per turn are nuts. By the way, like, IBM Watson has him as the highest rated uh, rookie at the moment. Um, <laughs> way above Shy. Um, but <laughs> I mean, Watson likes it when you win, though, and Atlanta went to the actual tournament. Yeah, right. right. Then, um, yeah, Georgia. that's also true. That's Th- then, it, it. yeah, I mean, and uh, did, uh, no, Atlanta didn't go 4 0, so, which is, I guess, yeah, they have one game less. Uh, one, yeah, okay. They have a bit, little bit of a better uh, win ratio, I suppose. Um, but yeah, like, the, the, I don't know. This kid is just a gamer. Like, he seems to be able to grind into er- almost everything. There's almost no like unless you have to play Edison at the same time, 
as he does mm. because he c- cannot physically um, operate two. Himself. Yeah, operate two. Uh, Sure. PC the, at the same time, you probably never want to play him ahead of him. Um, I think legitimately, if that uh, Ash Echo comp ha- would have stayed, Atlanta would have had the best DPS line in the world in that matter. Agreed. Um, and I don't know. Like the problem is, we haven't seen the full breadth of the ability that this kid has as well, because the hero pools have not totally yeah. re- requi- required uh, that of him. Even though you sometimes mm. see it uh, with the abilities that he has on Echo and doing duplicates and whatnot, um, I don't know. Like the, I think that the hard carry potential, especially in the ma- in the uh, knockout match, was like I don't know. I don't know if that series goes different, like the same way if you have any almost any other player on Echo in, uh, there, and. While Shy is a, definitely a fair shout, also one I've overlooked, I think there's the, the argument that he hasn't played most uh, for most of the season. Uh, sorry, that he hasn't played most or all of the season. For whatever mm. reason, and I agree that that is probably a mistake, a coaching mistake. Um, yeah, I mean... It's gonna ha- it'll haunt him. It'll, I agree. And he, Shy also hasn't seen the tournament stage yet, uh, which works a little bit into, against him. It's not his fault, of course. But I gotta see a little bit okay. more to say he has been the best performing rookie at this okay. point. Do we want to give some honorable mentions? Maybe a quick little sure. shout to maybe a second place or maybe filling out the ballot the rest of the way. Avril, I, do you have I anybody? Will, before we get there, I just want to comment on Pelican. Okay, as well. yeah, go ahead. It's like, Pelican, I feel to me, is for Atlanta Reign anyway, what Edison was supposed to be in the previous year. When they picked up Edison, I remember like Edison was like, this is like the superstar from contenders. He's going to be the mega hard carry. I'm not saying Edison isn't good or he didn't, yeah. he, he is not that, but I think Pelican lived up to that more than Edison did yeah. um, this year coming in. And especially with Edison now taking more of a backseat and Pelican's kind of like your starter. And Pelican's mm-hmm. like your, your definite starter in the Edison and Kai trade places, depending on what they want to run. Um, yeah, Pelican is someone that even preseason coming in, I had, you know, high hopes for us thinking this guy's definitely insane like O2 Blast uh, like Runaway like Ellen Mystic have produced a crap ton of yes. Overwatch League players over the years and just by the way if you think Pelican is good there's another player on O2 Blast that Pelican shadowed Pelican was like the Doha to the Sparkle and the Sparkle I'm talking about on O2 Blast is proper it's like there's another player on O2 Blast that was like more of like the ace play and Pelican yeah. played a m- bit more of a supportive role that's, that's still coming up for next year that's the new decay um, so, I mean, it's just, I don't know what it was, but the Pelican proper duo back in O2 Blast was absolutely nuts, and now Pelican, I wouldn't say on his own, but, like, going into Overwatch League on a new team with Atlanta Rain, working alongside Kai and Edison, yeah, I, I straight from this, I even, even pre-season looking at just DPS lines, you can look at those three and be like, well, the Atlanta have, like, a world-class DPS line, yeah. their DPS line is crazy good, so Pelican's success so far in the season does not surprise me at all. For sure. Now, I agree. In terms of honorable mentions, I have a, I have a nuts yeah. one. I have a nuts one, Joe. I have a, I have a pretty spicy. Well, I don't know if it's super spicy, but you go if you have a, a poignant one. I mean, I, I know I'm kind of tooting into the same horn I was tooting into in the preseason. Yeah, I think I know where you're headed. <laughs> but okay. like, cho- cho- someone hate choice one, please. Yeah. Ah. Uh, Man, yeah. this kid is so good as well. It's just so sad. Like, it feels so like it, th- this feels like a, f- a flashlight situation. Like, yeah, I don't know. This, this, he's the inheritor, the man. Of- he's the inheritor. Flan is just like hold this he's red getting, lantern. He's and- getting his piece. Yeah, he's getting his piece. <laughs> don't worry, it's coming. Ah, uh, man, this mob elf for me on your shoulders, would you? Yeah, I don't know. He has. He's he got has- broad shoulders. He is. Sorry, that's a squat, not a deadlift. Hold this barbell with your hands. <laughs> would you? Sure. Yeah. I'm sorry, I got the exercise wrong. My bad. Yeah, no, like, I, I don't know what the, um, what the, the solution to his issues is. I don't think it will resolve itself e- this season. Um, I think he will have to suffer for another eight games. I said, sure as hell not going to see a tournament. <laughs> and... Can we agree? So yeah. you can finish. No, no and, uh, cool. He will uh, probably be, be bought out by someone unless uh, Hopefully. Guangzhou probably Let's significantly upgrades next year. Yeah. 
we can agree that Pelican is the best player on. I'm not going to say the worst team, but like in terms of the 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 juxtaposition oh, like the, of it, like the best yeah. player on the on the on the lower performing team. Yeah, because there are worse teams at Guangzhou. But you know, when I say best player on the worst team, I mean like you know, yeah, in terms of the difference of how good he is versus how good his team is. Yes, there's no doubt about that in my mind. Yeah. Okay. That's not a bad show. Arvel, do you got anybody? Um. Give me another second. You go first. I should okay. one more second just to just to nail it down. I was big. I, I think um, my heart kind of sits in Europe. I, I've been excited to see Dredro finally get into the league for a long time. I think he, much like Shy, is going to be haunted by the fact that he came in kind of late. Um, however, Paris does have somebody that has been hyped up to me quite heavily. I was a uh, skeptical to say the least, but have has has met and kind of exceeded the expectations laid out to me and that's been Khan. I think Khan is a just a stud when it comes to a lot of different picks. The fact that I'm hearing that his Zenyatta is better than his Baptiste and his Baptiste was already impressive. Um I think he's he's got a very outside chance, but if, if Paris continue to do, to kind of make this Cinderella run um and be like the the pride and hope of Europe. Um I think he I think he's got a, a shot on this ballot and and to kind of make it deep. Uh Khan is Khan's no joke. Khan is no joke. Very impressed. I was very close to picking Jangu, but now that Houston are not Houston are doing this weird thing where they're getting it's he's splitting time with Dreamer and we're not too yeah, sure right. where Jangu is anymore. It's 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 muddy the waters a bit too much for me. Um so instead of Jangu, I'm gonna say like Gaga and said, who's a clear starter on the team, mm. um, has r vastly improved his team as well. Like has moved Chengdu from a bit of a meme squad to like, yo, we got like a hardcore real main tank that just does all of these things perfectly. And is mm. a better ball than Among as well, which is nuts. Um, so yeah, like another player that's been really a big part of Chengdu's success this year. Like I, I don't think this team works unless they have leave on the heater that he is just going absolutely crazy, but then also having the team to back him up, which includes Gaga. So yeah, to me, uh, that'd be my shout out. Do, do you think okay. Django actually has performed better this season than Piggy? Mm. Yeah, uh, that's he's he's caught up in flex tank jail. It's so hard to judge. Like, I think it's very safe to say that he's performed very, very well. But if you if you remove the nameplates and put him next to like a top player, like I don't know that I'd be able to really tell the difference. Like he is he is shrouded by his role. I think if he was to continue to perform at the degree that he is, but play a different role, I think it'd be much easier to really, really tell. It's not that yeah. I doubt him, but it's tough to see. It's very difficult to see. I feel like the stats we, are all there. The results are there. It's just I can't see it just yet. If if we played more Sigma, I think it would be more obvious because he pounds on Sigma. Okay. Um, mm. You need a meta where you have a carry flex tank, right? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Not a supporting flex tank. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, that's a fair shout. Like the 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 funny thing is, but in the very by the very same token, we talked about an hour about Dallas Fuel. We've not once or about the final, and we've not once mentioned Hanbin. And we yeah. mentioned Void once because he got a 3k <laughs> max call down. Yeah, he, we didn't talk about Flex other at all, right? Like, I was thinking about Hanbin the whole time. It's just I, unbelievable. It slipped my mind. Yeah. yeah. I mean, statistically, it has been killing it. It, it when it comes to like Diva performance, Sigma performance, like across the season as a whole. Uh, writing my article, Predding the Dallas Fuel coming into the June Joust, I think he was. Um, quite high in terms of a lot of different stats per 10 minutes um if you're interested in it go look it up um but yeah again it's it's i think you had the right thought experiment years ago when it was like you know think of your you know who in your mind who is the best flex support and it's really difficult to find like a concise and clear answer because of how many facets the role needs to kind of meet and be successful in um it's difficult to really understand it unless you're like particularly looking for it or are a or you're familiar with uh the level at which these players actually have to play and what they have to do and what they have to process um it's it's a tough role to kind of skim through and, and bod review in particular you have to really look for it um and that's not to say that hanbin and void and, and piggy are bad it's just 
their role is very difficult to eye test for i'd say you have to like watch their pov specifically in replay viewer yeah. and just like really scrutinize every single decision they make and you know see where all their cooldowns are um and it's hard as a, especially in the diva position as a supporting role as well where you're mm. you need to see them have high impact like usually when people say there's a good diva place like they're eating a lot of ults right like that's all they get massive you know self-destructs which is what poker was doing the first season which is why he got a lot of attention um mm. but if you're just doing your job correctly and you're mostly invisible you know i'm not, I'm not talking about you're not eating a shitload of ults you're not getting a lot of self-destruct kills but you're just you're peeling at the right times you're putting pressure where you need to um and it's not like super flashy it's just what it's just part of the dirty job you do it's not super noticeable but it is very good it's hard to tell that unless you are very specifically going through a pov and scrutinizing every decision they make but i mean even when I was watching June Joust for the tournament, um, Hanbin's D.Va for me has been a big point because I didn't think about this guy as a big D.Va player previously. Yet even his own team, Sparkle in particular, memed the fact that he's like a Sigma 1 trick, right? Because like mm -hmm. Hanbin for me really made his name and really came up big during the Sigma meta oh, totally. of 2019 when they won Gauntlet. Uh, and since then, you know, it, his hero picks are like Sigma's been the number one. He's like a Krong type player. Like Sigma's mm, the number yeah. one. For and then after that, it's like a little bit wishy-washy. Um, so Diva wasn't a particular pick where you're like Harmon's Diva is just phenomenal. Like that's some void you think that, but not but not some like Harmon. When I was like looking through um, the grand finals and you know Harmon was definitely Im impressive. It's just hard to pick him when you know you got guys like Fearless on the team where he's got he's got yeah. the plot armor and the narrative behind. He's got the protagonist <laughs> narrative behind him. It's hard to pick anybody else, right? Hard to talk about anybody else. Um, you know the rest of <laughs> the rest of the Overwatch League are just all side characters to Fearless's hero's journey through this anime apparently um and then he's you know you could make an argue for most improved but i thought Hanbin was, was already performing pretty well with the team even from the start um and he's not a rookie so yeah i don't know but definitely a player that hasn't been talked about enough even here agreed 100 percent. true 100 percent awesome well this has been a much longer episode than I thought it was going to be, <laughs> but we just ended up talking about certain things for a very long time, much longer than I thought. Um, coming up in future for people at home is we're going to, not we, but like you know, what where the league is going to talk about in the future and to also watch is there will be a Texas live event for their, you know, Battle of Texas. It's not a homestand technically because apparently the Dallas will be playing from Dallas in a live event with their fans, and Houston will be playing in Houston, where their team is going to be with their fans as, as well. So they're not actually on land. They're not in the same venue, the two teams, but they will be live events. So, I mean, pretty cool. It's not a homestand, but it is a very cool. You're going to get a really awesome live event. Anybody, anywhere close to Houston or Dallas, go and check it out. Tell us how it is, um, because when I saw the Hangzhou homestand, it was absolutely brilliant. So that's something to look forward to as well. Next week on TCP, for episode 180 as we're two, 20 episodes away from hitting that 200 uh we're going to be doing our summer showdown preview episode where we talk about you know look at the standings look at the matches coming up as well uh who's got a better strength of schedule our expectations for the new meta as well as how teams are going to place and do in that new meta and just generally you know the direction of where we think summer showdown is going to go um is dallas going to get back in the grand finals is shanghai going to be there is it going to be another shanghai versus dallas kind of our classico at this point between the two regions or can there be other teams to line up as well and beyond that uh one last shout out to contenders eu and na which is currently happening in the tournaments uh we have herex which has been a guest on the show that is going to be casting that so make sure you tune in to contenders north america and europe support tier two or i'm gonna come and find you and uh spank you with my very my very pink runaway paddle right here um, or just just force you to take a very good look at yourself as to why you're not supporting tier two. All right, so there you go. Make sure you do that. All right, guys. Good show. Good episode. Yeah. Say so we covered quite a lot. Oh yeah. Stay tuned, folks. Thanks for thanks for watching. Uh, we'll see you next week. This has been episode one seven nine of Tactical Crouch. See you next week. Bye. Bye.